A guy calls out to a young man and tells him he has a one in a million talent for martial arts. He says that if he joined the Steel Bone sect, his potential would be limitless. Sweating, the young man tries to look up and ask the guy talking to him to take his foot off his head. This is our protagonist and leader of the Steel Bone sect, Jim Changxiao. He tells the guy who's stepping on him that he saw him hitting his disciple. The guy says he was just trying to chat with her, so our boy grabs him by the collar and says that's fine then. He'll give him a little more time to think about his offer to join his sect. Trembling, the guy says he's already joined the Rising Water sect. Jun then says it's a shame, but it seems like his destiny isn't with the Steel Bone sect. He asks Kanshin if this guy was bothering her. She's the first disciple of the sect and says he tried to touch her hand. At that, Jun kicks the guy in the chin, saying he's looking for trouble. While the guy begs him to stop, insisting he wasn't trying to offend the girl, the poor guy gets beaten up in the jungle. After that, the two leave with Jun asking Kanshin if he looked cool, and she wonders why he only punched the guy in the face. From a distance, the poor guy vows to make them pay for this. Then we arrive at the Steel Bone sect. The leader of this place once jumped off a cliff and survived, and that's how he founded this sect and named it. After 10 continuous years of work, he finally turned it into a level 9 sect. However, he was sent to prison for causing trouble at his cousin's house. And when he tried to escape, he was executed. And that's how Arjun became the leader of this incredible place. He took control of this body when its owner was crushed by the entrance sign. The poor guy couldn't believe he'd have to take over such a fool's place. But none of that would kill his determination. Like people from other stories, he's sure he'll receive a system and become a genius. At that moment, the system appears. He's confused, wondering if it's really going to be that easy. Along with the area, a little window pops up. Our boy thinks the interface has appeared in full force. But what shows up are details about the sect, stating that it's a level 1 place with one member and zero contributions. His task was to transform this failing sect into the greatest in the entire world, with 100,000 disciples within 100 years. He thinks that for a first mission, it doesn't sound too easy, especially considering he's incredibly weak, the place is bankrupt, and it has only one member. He concludes that no system would ever offer a mission without some kind of reward if it were impossible. It must be because of the body that died crushed. Then a notification appears, telling him to open the first gift. He smiles, saying he knew getting something was impossible otherwise, and in his hands, a spatial ring appears. He's confused, wondering what kind of finger this size is meant for if that's supposed to be a ring. Our boy's name means someone who smiles a lot. However, it's going to be hard to keep smiling considering he's received a basically impossible mission. Normally, people receive tons of power and abilities, so why did he get this gigantic ring? Even though it didn't look like it, it had an inscription saying it was indeed a ring. Since it was a spatial ring, he decided to check if there was anything inside. A lot of special effects happened and he imagined there'd be some treasures. However, when he went in, there was just a chunk of a block. He wondered why it seemed so useless. He was expecting a legendary weapon, some kind of guardian, or something that would change his life. However, he hears a heartbeat coming from the block. He's sure there's some kind of martial genius inside that will teach him everything. Obviously, something kept inside such a rare item couldn't be useless. Then, a strange writing appears, showing the detonation time is 99 years and 23 hours. The bomb would only be disarmed if he completed the main mission. He throws the thing away, wondering why the artifact he received is actually a bomb. Strangely, a timer decreases whenever it's tossed around. He says it's useless, and the timer isn't even counting down right. The system mourns that the item has a soul and consciousness, so if he irritates it, the countdown will go faster. The poor guy makes a little prayer, hoping to recover the time. He apologizes to the stone and tells the system he wants to go home because this reincarnation is a joke. However, the system says there's no way back and if he doesn't complete the mission, he'll be blown up forever. Finally, he receives the first item, the Calamity Saber. The thing drops right between his legs. The system tells him at least it's good for him to make good use of it. He decides to check some information to figure out how he's going to do this. The things he has no idea about yet are what this sect construction business is and what the contribution value means. The system gives him a list of tasks ranging from building a medicine refining place to a beast tower. And when he reaches level 5 or higher, he will be able to see more. He asks how he's supposed to do these things and the system says he will need more disciples. And to increase contribution, he has to place valuable treasures in the sect. With that, he could buy treasures and he gets interested. He asks how to open this shop and the system says he needs one point. He immediately wants to know how to get it. The system tells him he will need more disciples. He already understands that everything depends on his disciples, since he will need construction and treasure points. He decides that his task from now on will be to recruit more people, so he gets to work. He makes a recruitment sign and says that with his charm, he'll have at least 103 days. However, a month and a half passes and the poor guy is left abandoned. He wonders how it's possible that not a single person has shown up, until someone calls out to him. Kanshin shows up and says she wants to join the sect. He immediately pulls out the instant noodles runs up to her face and says she's beautiful and that the boss is willing to accept her. She says that if he's the boss, she's no longer interested in joining. Our boy tells her not to give up so easily, saying the place has a lot of potential. 
He starts making up all sorts of stories talking about how hard he worked to get to his position, that he's new, that he's going to develop this place. He didn't have to insist much, and she accepted, which he finds suspicious, but it's fine since that's what he wanted. With that, the sect reaches two members, and the contribution increases to one. Now he can take a look at the system shop. He's eager to see the secret techniques that will make him invincible. However, what he gets is a new player pack worth one measly point. He turns around crying, saying he should've known it wasn't going to be so easy to get something good. The system asks if he wants to take a look at the pack, and he obviously says yes. He receives two items that help him escape and another one that makes him take less damage. Clearly, his life isn't going to be easy. He then opens the spatial ring and takes a look at the items. He asks the system about the experience item, and the system says just breaking it will make him a little stronger. Right away, he breaks the item, saying his time has come. With that, his power starts to increase, and he says he now feels the path of immortality. However, the system tells him to wake up to reality. The place he's in now is below the normal minimum. He asks what this power seal opening is, and the system says it's to unlock the Calamity Saber. He asks what kind of level 1 weapon needs to be unlocked. However, at least he gets an important piece of information. The system tells him about a nearby city where he could recruit other disciples. That's when suddenly, something comes spinning in the air and five guys appear in front of the two. They're confused, wondering who these crazy people are. It's the bandana guy saying it was he who beat up the poor guy. Unfortunately, the two don't even remember who this guy is. Kanshin asks, and our boy says he thinks it's the guy he stepped on. The bandana guy says Jun was bold to hit someone from the rising sect and asks for his name. Our boy says he's Jun, the leader of the Steel Bone sect. Everyone recognizes this sect as the one from the old leader who got caught at his cousin's house and then died trying to escape from prison. Jun shouts at them to stop slandering their sect like that. However, the guy wants to know how the leader of a worthless sect dares to harm his disciple. Our boy confidently tells Chanchen to take a step back because he's going to take care of everyone. She just tells him to remember that before he dies, she'll have to take the position from him. He's confused because she's the only disciple who wants to steal his position. But confidently, she activates the power she received. And with that, a fiery aura starts coming out of the boy. The guys ask if this isn't the weakest leader they've ever seen since the guy's only at level 3. Everyone starts laughing, saying they've seen apprentices stronger than this leader. Then the guys activate their auras, saying they'll save time and finish him off quickly. Kanshin quickly notices that the boy has dragged himself all over the field. She asks if he doesn't understand the situation. The apprentices next to her couldn't even react to this, and the system gives him the mission to deal with these four guys. From the ground, the boss asks how it's possible for someone with three energy points to be so strong. Our boy says it's obvious. It's because he's a sect leader. And immediately, the bandana guy's apprentices jump in, saying they won't let him get away with this. However, Jun reveals the fifth circle around his arm, which is the level he reached by breaking that seal. And the idiots realize that he had hidden his power. With that, he easily takes care of the guys. Everyone falls to the ground, and he calls Chanchen to leave. With that, they head towards the city. But on the way, she says he should have killed them to avoid future problems. Our boy asks why they would be so cruel. She replies that in the Starry Land continent, you can't show mercy to enemies. He doesn't even know that he's not qualified to be a sect leader. Our boy remembers that the laws here are very different from those on Earth. It's a place where he can't afford to be merciful. However, the system gives him a secondary mission. He is to educate Chanchen about his beliefs and protect his dignity as the sect leader. Our boy wonders why he would have to go through something like this but he understands that he must assert his authority as the leader of the sect. So he says he understands that they can't be kind to enemies. However, she needs to remember that they are martial artists who seek truth and purity. There's no reason to harm those who pose no threat, as it would only stain their reputation. The system congratulates him for the lesson, and he gains a point. Confidently, he feels the wind hit his back at the perfect moment, making him look stylish as he speaks. Kanshin says she understands that the master can't do that, but she will finish them off instead. Our boy tells her she needs to be a bit calmer because she only ever talks about fighting and killing. She immediately points her sword at him and asks why a woman couldn't just focus on fighting and killing. She would obey him as the leader, but he better not underestimate her. Our boy is startled by her aggressive reaction, already certain she's been through a lot. He then glances at the system. For having beaten the guys and giving the moral lesson, he now has 10 points. As they walk, she wonders what the idiot is doing. Our boy wants to buy something, but the problem is that everything is too expensive. Until he finds a junior healing pill worth one point. However, he decides to save it for when he's dying. Suddenly, Kangshin stops and warns that someone is watching them. The bushes ahead are rustling and our boy imagines it must be a destructive creature. He warns Changchen that this path looks bad and suggests they change routes. However, she says she feels it's not a frightening creature. She points and says it's actually a badly injured human. Jun gets closer and says the wounds look severe. Since the breathing's failing, he knows the guy is on the verge of death. It seems like he fought a creature and ended up losing. She says she understands and asks when they're leaving. 
Our boy questions if she's not even slightly inclined to save the poor guy. She asks why he wants to save him if he's not a medicine cultivator. Clearly, there's nothing he can do. He starts to materialize the pill, saying that he may not know how to create one, but he has one of these spending a point in the process. He didn't expect to use it so soon, but is eager to see the effect. He gives the pill to the guy. Kanchin says that any common medicine won't heal the internal injuries he has. However, at that moment, she hears a cough. The guy is already getting up, and our boy asks what she thinks of that. She's confused about how someone on the verge of death was revived as soon as they took this pill. Maybe her master is more mysterious than she thought. Meanwhile, the scoundrel is only thinking about how to get rich by selling it. He immediately orders the system to open the shop, saying he wants to buy a bunch more. Considering that in the martial world, people get hurt all the time, he'd become a king. With that money, he'd buy tons of disciples and the sect would grow giant. However, he can only buy one per month. At that moment, his dream of getting rich is shattered. That's when he notices the guy he healed is gone. She says he left without saying anything. Our boy asks how someone can be so ungrateful. He spent a contribution point and an item that won't return for a month. Kanchin suggests that he should be a little crueler, as he won't gain anything by being good in their land. The poor guy was thinking of saving the man, but he fled just like that. He starts to realize that in this place there are no laws, and the moral restrictions of Earth don't apply here. He allowed to get used to the starry land and follow the rules of this world. Basically, living by the law of the jungle. Here he can have 50 women and be the richest in the world, as long as he's tremendously strong. The system strangely congratulates him for understanding how this place works, and he gains 10 contribution points. He didn't know that there were secret missions like this. The system explains that there are main missions, secondary missions, and secret missions. And lastly, there's something called epic missions, but he's too weak to know about that. Our boy already wants one of those knowing the reward must be great. The system tells him that when he reaches the right level, those missions will be unlocked. He asks when that will happen, and the system says that information is not available. He celebrates at least gaining 10 points to buy something in the shop. At that moment, someone slashes him in the face with a sword. It's Kanchen who tells him they've arrived at Jining City. Our boy takes a look and notices the city walls are incredibly tall. Seeing this, he vows that one day the Seal Bone sect will be more magnificent than this city. The guys nearby ask why an idiot disciple of this failing sect is here. Our boy tells them he's not a disciple. He's the leader of the Steel Bone sect. Everyone falls silent and then starts laughing in his face, saying this is ridiculous. Not only is it idiotic that a sect like this still exists, but also that he had the audacity to show up at the recruitment meeting. Others say they can feel that at most he has the power of someone who awakened three levels. And with that, the poor guy was mocked from all sides. He never imagined it would be so difficult to carry the name of this place. Why did he come to a world where not only did he receive a system that doesn't help much, but also a negative reputation? Kanchen touches his shoulder. He turns around saying that at least he can count on her. But she just says she understands he's feeling extremely embarrassed by the reputation. He feels desolate that this disciple doesn't hold back with her words. However, he stands up and says he's heard much worse and won't be affected by others' criticism. It's time for them to head to the recruitment area. On the way, she asks how he can stand being humiliated like this, and he wonders how this damn girl knows what he's thinking. However, he replies that he just has to endure a little because the only thing that makes him shut up is showing power. So far, he had completed missions given by the system, but now he would finally make the first move. The domination of Starry Land was about to begin. Meanwhile, in another nearby tent, a boy tells his master that this year they will recruit many high-quality youths. However, one next to him says they are a level 8 sect, so they should forget about getting the talented kids. This year, the Gentle Blade sect would take all the first-ranked disciples. The two start arguing, wanting to see who will get the best ones. Until someone walks between them, throws an umbrella on the ground, and says this cheap tent wasn't so bad after all. The Saber guy asks who he thinks he is to stand next to his sect, and the one next to him warns that he's the leader of the Steel Bone sect which is the disgrace of all sects. The saber guy then says he will be kind and give him the chance to move away from that spot. Our boy replies that all sects are members of the Alliance, so they can remain in harmony. However, the old man on the other side says he would have considered that in the past, but having a sect like his next to their tent is a disgrace. Jun says the tent will stay there whether they like it or not, and no bald guy around will stop his plans. They say that even though he's not bald, he doesn't have any members, and they immediately order them to be removed from there. Our boy stands up and says it's a great chance to get some publicity for the sect. But at that moment, someone shouts that Lai King Yang from that family is arriving. Immediately, one of the old men says he doesn't care about Jun and is going to do what's most important. Our boy thinks that name sounds familiar. The others nearby comment that as a descendant of the Lee family, this guy has incredible talent. Talent in this world is defined by the spiritual root, which determines the maximum power someone can achieve in their life. In a small place like this city, even a medium root is something very rare. While our boy has an inferior root, he knows this Lai King Yang is a once-in-a-generation talent and he'll have to trick him somehow to make him join the sect. However, a crowd is already calling for the guy, offering all sorts of support, even other positions, all the resources he wants, and even the command over all the disciples. 
He's just standing there, enjoying being pampered by everyone. At that moment, our boy asks if Chan Chin knows that guy. She says he's the one who was injured under the tree who he saved. He sees that it's the boy and says this is interesting. At that moment, an old man approaches and calls out to King Yang, asking if he wants to join the Kangshan Mountain sect. Everyone knows this is a level 5 sect in King Yang City. Considering how talented the boy is, it's definitely a great option. Our boy tries to pretend this doesn't mean anything to him, but is disheartened that there are such strong people around. But then someone approaches, it's King Yang, who asks if the guy there is the leader of the Steel Bone sect. Everyone is confused, wondering why he would go to that trash sect. Chen says yes, he's the leader of the incredible Steel Blood sect. The bald men wonder if they're hallucinating seeing this. Why is the genius of King Yang's city bowing to that trash? Kanshin is already excited to see this. King Yang apologizes for not thanking him when he saved him. Our boy says he's just a kid, and that it was nothing. He pulls him by the arm and says that if he hadn't thanked him now, he wouldn't even have remembered it. Kanshin knows the rascal intends to use this as an excuse, and at that moment, the guy asks him to talk a little more about his sect. Our boy then receives his secondary mission. He gets all excited and even gives himself a slap to hide the smile. He needs to tell the glorious story of the Steelbone sect and make the guy join. However, Jun wonders since when they had a glorious history. At that moment, the three old men say that place is not worthy of him. Their greatest contribution was that the previous owner helped stop the distribution of explicit products. Jun says they better not talk like that of the glorious Steel Bone sect. It's just that common people don't know that, in fact, his sect is much older and has a long history. King Yang asks to know more, and the others wonder why the boy seems interested. So our boy asks if he knows about the Eastern Sea. King Yang says he's heard it's an endless sea full of terrifying sea creatures. Jun then says that at the end of the sea lies the state of LA. There you'll find two divine mountains, the Flower Mountain and the Steel Bone Mountain. Our boy decides to adapt an existing story that no one there knows. He says that the Steel Bone sect was born from this mountain. The first elder of the sect was known as Sun Wukong, also called the Monkey King. The people around say that this story sounds pretty realistic. Could it be true? However, the old man shouts that it doesn't make sense. The Eastern Sea is extremely dangerous and even martial emperors don't dare venture into it. Besides, he's never heard of this state of al -Lai or this mountain. Chun says that clearly the old man doesn't know anything about Starry Land. The old man starts cursing, saying he's been around much longer than Jun, and then asks him to tell the story of this son Wukong. Jun then says that Wukong's master gained the power of nature after being incubated for more than a thousand years. He then fled to the Fanglia Mountains where he practiced. All this, of course, is a story he's stealing. The old man says it doesn't make sense for him to have incubated the power for so long since humans are made of flesh and bone. Jun says that apparently the old man knows less than he thought and doesn't understand the evolution of all creatures. The old man replies that everything he's been saying makes no sense. However, King Yang simply says he never imagined they had such a rich history. But even if this sect has such a past, what is the advantage of joining it now? The old man gets emotional. That was the perfect question. Even if they have a history, the sect is worthless now. Our boy says that indeed nothing lasts forever and the sect became what it is now. However, this also proves they have survived through time, showing a solid foundation. And their knowledge is applied in things like the pill he gave away. King Yang knows that the pill healed him in seconds as if by a miracle. Not to mention that he gave it to a stranger he didn't even know, which isn't normal in this place. Maybe what he's saying makes some sense. Our boy then says he will revitalize the sect and what the others can offer now might be slightly better. But only with them would King Aim become a true martial emperor. The old man shouts, asking how he dares say such things. An emperor is the highest stage a human can reach. However, King Yang interrupts his speech saying okay and agrees to join the Steel Bone sect. With that, it's confirmed. The 16-year-old boy, a top-ranking talent at level 10, had joined the sect. With this, Jun earns 5 points. Man, this system is stingy. But now they have 3 members and 20 contribution points. The old man approaches Kim Yang saying he has a promising future and shouldn't waste his superior route on such a trashy sect. However, Jun says that while the situation isn't great now and it won't stay that way for long, he guarantees that within 3 years at most, his sect will surpass the Kangshan Mountain sect. The old man asks what he means by surpassing their sect and says he better learn to choose his words carefully. Making his sect stronger than Kangshan Mountain, he'll have to help the boy understand the difference between the two. However, King Yang calls for Elder Mei and asks him not to disrespect his sect leader. The old man is confused about when this happened. He then turns around and says he understands and wants to see how Jun will develop this place. Until someone asks Elder Mei to wait a minute. It's Master Lai, King Yang's father, who says his son is still very young and naive. He will accept the offer on his son's behalf. However, King Yang says he's already in the Steel Bone sect. But his father orders him to shut up, saying that this decision affects the entire family, so it's not up to him. The boy, however, responds that his father taught him to be honest, and now that he's joined the Steel Bone sect, he's not leaving. 
Angry, his father says that if he doesn't leave this sect now, he will no longer be cared for as a son and immediately starts coughing, his health deteriorating. The man next to him tells the young master to understand that his father is sick and cannot be stressed. Another adds that being just to his father is the basis of all virtue, so he shouldn't act this way. King Yang remains silent. Then someone touches his shoulder. It's our boy who says he guarantees that King Yang will go far. The old man is furious because he knows this boy was tricked by this scoundrel. He then says that to make an extraordinary disciple, the person himself must be extraordinary. If he's so confident, he must be very experienced. Our boy says he doesn't want to be too arrogant, but he alone knows more than all of them combined. Qianchen thinks this exaggeration of his is getting out of control. The father obviously doesn't want to accept this and says that if that's the case, he should teach everyone a little. He pulls out a book, saying that in King Yang City, there's a technique that has been passed down for hundreds of years. It's called the Nine Styles of Wielding a Sword. However, even after years and years of practice, no one has ever mastered the Ninth Style. If Jun manages that, he will believe his words. Otherwise, he will have to expel his son from the sect. Our boy smiles, thinking this bastard is trying to embarrass him in front of everyone. However, he just replies that it's not a problem. He immediately tells the system to open the shop. He remembers a spell that would work in this situation. It allows him to instantly understand the martial arts and secrets of his opponent for 60 minutes. He activates the power right away. He quickly skims through the book. As he flips through the pages, everyone watches. People wonder what he's learning given how fast he's going through the pages. Our boy decides to make up any random name and calls it Quantum Meditation. And with that, bam, he closes the book. He then asks Changshin to give him a sword. As soon as he grabs it, he unleashes lightning and makes a cut that exudes an aura. The old man is shocked by the pressure in the air created by that. The boy had mastered the first style in just one minute. He made another slash, which was the second style's attack. The old man was stunned since it took him five days to get that far. Then Jun made the third cut, forcing the old men to dodge to avoid being killed. Jun says he's going too slow and leaps into the sky, sending a downward slash that's the eighth style. The guys are shocked that he really learned so quickly. However, seeing that he stopped, the old man asks if he didn't learn the ninth style. Our boy continues concentrating his aura. Behind him, King Yang notices it's the realm of the sword. Everyone starts speculating, wondering how this is possible, until an old man tells everyone to shut up. This is a rare chance in anyone's life, so they shouldn't disturb him. Our boy responds that he's not bad, and if that's the case, he wants the old man to help him test his power as he thinks the old man is the only one who would survive his attack. With that, an aura emanates from the sword, and an explosion is launched in the old man's direction. The slash moves like a fin cutting through the sea toward the old man, who has to defend himself before he can respond. He realizes the power of it is truly impressive. However, he manages to tear the attack in half, proving the boy is an apprentice and worst of all, at the fifth power level. The father asks if that was the true ninth style. He says that it's no weaker than a common martial art, but that's because our boy is weak, not because the technique is bad. He turns to Jun and says it's incredible that he mastered it in two minutes. Master Jun had won his admiration, while in the background, the merchants were all in a mess. The old man then says he's been practicing a certain technique that takes years to learn, and he hoped Jun could guide him. People wonder why a level 5 elder of the Kangshin Mountain is asking for help. That man was a true master of the arts, so why was he seeking advice from a level 9 sect master? Our boy eager to take advantage of the item's effect as he can humbly try something like that. With that, the old man begins to share his knowledge. A moment later, the elder is already thanking him, saying this explanation gave him new insights. Our boy says that if he practices this for two months, he'll reach the next level. The old man runs off, saying he has things to take care of. Another guy also asks for advice and soon a bunch of people are lining up, even willing to pay for tips. Our boy still has 57 minutes of power left. He wonders if he could keep helping others or maybe charge for each consultation and make a ton of money. The people are desperate, saying they'll pay. He even gives a number 38 ticket to one of the guys and everyone is desolate at the thought of waiting that long. Someone tries to cut the line, but a slash almost takes off his hair and Chanchen warns him not to have that kind of idea. Then someone else hands money to our boy, thanking him. He's thrilled. He's not only learning the techniques of others, but also making a profit. Until the next one comes, it's King Yang's father, who says he has a problem and wants help. Our boy says yes, but it'll cost a thousand. Angry, he asks why he has to pay ten times more than everyone else since he gave up his son. Our boy then says that since he's King Yang's father, he'll only charge one coin. That's a special benefit for relatives of disciples. Immediately, everyone in line has the same idea and starts grabbing their kids, pushing them toward our boy, saying they want to join his sect. Our boy smiles and calls for Chanchen and King Yang, saying now the recruitment has officially begun. A little time passes and our boy is stamping a bunch of papers. Obviously, unlike King Yang, many of the people he accepted were much more ordinary and not as talented. But that was fine. The sect was already nearing 100 members. The crazy leader thought that reaching the 100,000 members he needed wouldn't be so difficult. He finally reached the 100th member. 
However, the system then informed him that he had actually hit the member limit, and if he accepted another, he would be punished. That's when he realized it wasn't a mission, it was a limit. The most important thing, in fact, was the sex achievements, and he wanted to know how to accomplish this. The system explained that he would have to send people on missions, and when they achieve enough accomplishments, the limit would increase. He was devastated, realizing he had worked hard for the wrong thing, until someone approached and asked if he was Jun Changxiao. He said he had heard that Jun had beaten a disciple of the Rising Water sect and questioned if he really thought he would get away with it. People recognized him as Wai Yinyu, the elder of the Rising sect. Last year, something similar happened, and the guy who had beaten a member of the Rising sect was beaten and lost everything. Our boy asks Xing Yang why everyone fears this sect since it's only level 9. He explains that it's because all their elders are level 5, which is why people are afraid. The man tells him that now that he knows how incredible he is, he better kneel and apologize. And the first mission of the sect arrives. He would have to teach this guy a lesson. Our boy says that considering they provoked his disciple, the punishment he gave was small. What this guy was doing here was ungrateful and unjust. The man asks if he's looking for death and challenges him to the duel platform. King Yang notes that the guy is already at level 12. And in the duel arena, it's a fight to the death, so his chances of getting out alive were slim. However, strangely, Jun is confident and says this saves him a lot of trouble. The scene quickly shifts to the middle of the arena and everyone finds it incredible that the leader accepted the challenge. King Yang asks if the chief is really that strong, seeing that he accepted this challenge. Tianxin says that he's actually only at the fifth level. Then the man asks if Jun has any last words. Wai Yinu says he would have let him live if he had apologized, but now that he's in the arena, he's going to die. He boasts about his physical training over the years, saying that with his strength, even without using any energy, he can crack a rock. Jun asks when he's going to stop talking about everything he has, and the man leaps forward with a punch. The attack hits Jun squarely in the chest, but Jun doesn't even budge. The guy's hand trembles. Jun asks if he's even started yet. The man then talks about Master Fan, the greatest blacksmith in the region, who spent his life creating unimaginable treasures. The blade he acquired is as precious as his life, and today is the first time it's being shown in front of others. Our boy notices some chips on the blade's tip and asks if it's already worn out. The man explains that a 100% flawless treasure from the master was too expensive, so he had to get one with some flaws, but then he makes a slash that cracks the entire ground, warning that with this blade he can easily kill anyone, and tells Jun to draw his own sword. Our boy, all smiles, goes into the system. He tells the guy to calm down a bit because he's still choosing. He then pulls one from the shop, a cold sword of a junior that costs 10 contribution points. Inu says that now that he's drawn, he's going in. He uses the desert slash technique. Jun ignores him and comments that the system's sword is quite impressive. He wants to see how powerful it is. With that, he uses the nine styles technique he had learned. His blade slash easily stops the desert technique and Yinu's blade falls to the ground. The poor guy had lost an arm. Our boy wonders if he overdid it, but considering this world's laws, maybe it was appropriate. He jumps down from the arena thinking that since the guy wanted to go against him, this is the price he paid. Our boy calls the other two to head back to the sect. The old men are impressed that he actually defeated the guy. However, there would be severe repercussions from the Rising Water sect. In front of the city, our boy stops. He tells King Yang that when he goes to the sect, he won't see his parents anymore, so he should spend the last 10 days with them. However, the boy replies that his father returned to practice, so if he goes back, he'll only find him in isolation. Our boy says that in that case, what are they going to do with the sect? But at that moment, King Yang says he has an audacious request. He wants to bring his beloved to the sect. Our boy asks if it's a man or a woman, and King Yang says of course it's a woman, but she's a simple girl from a poor family. Immediately, Jun understands and asks if this is why he joined the Steel Bone sect. The boy replies that yes, he knows Kangshin would never accept something like this. Jun says that for now they need people to help with cleaning, but how is it possible for a 16-year-old to be this in love already? Especially considering that his leader is still single. Doesn't he think about the suffering our boy is going through? But fine, he tells him to bring the girl. However, then he finds a letter. It seems she thought she would hinder his future if she stayed by his side, so she left. Our boy cruelly says that if she was really poor and weak, maybe it was for the best. The poor guy goes silent. King Yang then asks if she isn't suitable for him. However, Jun says that he doesn't think so, it's what others will think. And at that moment, the boy gets motivated, saying that when he becomes a strong master, he'll go to the ends of the earth to find her again. Jun responds that if that's the case, he'll help the boy become that strong person. The boy is all emotional until they arrive in front of the ruined sect. He asks if it's too late for him to want to go back to the city. Jun says there's nothing to worry about, he made a lot of money and will fix everything. Until he sees a kid peeing on his sect and orders him to get out of there. The kid runs off saying he'll call his mother. Our boy mutters that he almost killed that child but calms down. He says he can't fight with a kid that young and tells him to go inside, not before getting hit on the head again. Then he draws his sword, saying this sect is trash, and he's going to cut it to pieces. The scene shifts to him talking about the first mission of the sect, 
It was the honorable task of having the chance to arrange the wood and fix the windows of the place. He leaves this to the incredible servant Kim Yang, who is extremely reliable. He complains of a headache and runs off to his room. The two just stand there thinking the boy has accepted that his sect is a disgrace. However, a few days pass and several people are already working there. The renovation is going much better than he imagined and he can really count on King Yang. It was perfect because he could dedicate time to his own cultivation. He even bought an aptitude flu that increases the power of those who are weak. Since this determines a person's maximum strength, he first needed to build a good foundation. At that moment, he felt that internal part of his body change. And with that, his spiritual root was increased from inferior to common. The system congratulated him because he also leveled up to the seventh level. The circles appear around him and he gets all excited, but he knows it won't be enough to take down the rising water sect. So he asks the system if there's a faster way to boost his power. The system says he can exchange contribution points for power. No, he'll die if he doesn't do this, he agrees immediately. His points go from 47 to 0 and his level goes from 7 to 10. He's thrilled, saying he feels the power and punches the wall, noting it's really different being like this. However, he punches a hole in the wall. Kin Yang says that the wall he just broke will cost at least 200 coins to repair. Our boy hands over the money, says he trusts him, and goes back to practice. Kin Yang says that if no more walls are destroyed in three days, they'll finish. Those three days pass. Our boy has been practicing some of the techniques he learned from the guys in the city, but it's not easy to evolve. But then he gets a shock. The sect was much more beautiful than he imagined. It had a lake and distinct architecture, even a balcony, and some stylish stones. He couldn't believe that was his sect. King Yang asks if he's satisfied with the renovations. Our boy says yes, he even thought he had changed worlds. The boy smiles and says he'll take him to the training area. He also wants to show him the cost of all of this. All that's left for our boy is about 200 coins. He asks if there really isn't anything left for the entire sect. King Yang says yes, construction is still ongoing, so they're in debt by about 4,000. Our boy asks since when he's been in debt to the system and to people. However, the first disciples he recruited that day start arriving. Our boy notices there aren't as many as he called and asks what happened. The guy in front explains that others live in more remote areas, so it will take a few days. Meanwhile, someone is approaching. The guy is exhausted at the door, begging for help. People notice the person at the door, and the poor guy stumbles over the wood. He almost falls flat on his face, but the two save him. King Ye notes that it's strange our boy arrived faster than him. The boy then says they were coming in a group of 30 people, but they were kidnapped by bandits. Jun says he understands and tells him to come in and rest while asking who dared to do this. The message says to prepare the money and go to Black Mountain or everyone will be killed. Enraged, Jun says that apparently those guys are tired of living. The scene changes to him leaving the sect. King Yang shouts, saying that Black Mountain has over 200 bandits and their leader is extremely strong. If he's going, at least he should take him along. But Jun just tells him to stay there and take care of the sect, that this is an order. He can't let the bandits of this world think they can do whatever they want to his people. The scene shifts to the mountain. Some bads are standing in the middle of a staircase, until one of them tells the others to take a look. It seems like there's a crazy person trying to climb that mountain. The guy tells him to hand over everything he has or else he'll have to search for it, warning that if he has to look for it, Jun won't leave in one piece. However, Jun just wants to know if the boss is in the fort. The guys ask what he's talking about, but in a second, Jun moves and disconnects one of their heads. Trembling, the other guy says, yes, the boss is up there. Jun then orders them to let the boss know that the leader of the Steel Bone sect has arrived. The scene shifts to the entrance of the base. Several bandits are getting ready. A bunch of guys surround Jun and say the leader ordered them not to kill him so they could have a fair fight. He notices that the base is surrounded by mountains. It's no wonder people have a hard time dealing with these guys. The gate opens and as he enters, he sees some guys getting whipped, another with blood on his skull, and a bunch of people on a throne watching him. Our boy immediately realizes that the guys in front are the elites of this place, each of them likely at least level 10. The guy on the throne is undoubtedly a qualified martial arts apprentice. The guy says he's honored by Jun's presence because it brings glory to this place. Seeing that the guy has 10 times his power, Jun thinks maybe he shouldn't have come alone. So he replies that he's only there to take back his sex disciples. The boss says he doesn't like wasting time either, and it will be 100 coins per head. Since he took more than 30, it will be 3,000 in total. The guys next to him say Jun is lucky, it's usually 200 per person. But Jun asks what he thinks about one coin per person. If everyone there kneels and apologizes, that's all he'll charge. The boss questions if Jun is telling some kind of joke and snaps his fingers. Immediately, someone emerges from the shadows, driving one of the disciples who's begging for help. Jun is startled and the boy is thrown in front of the boss, who says he'll kill one of his disciples today. Maybe that's good news since it's one less head for Jun to pay for. Crying, the desperate boy begs not to be killed and is even willing to join the bandit sect and become their slave. The guys laugh, saying it's ironic to see a kid so scared. Jun is furious at the child for wanting to switch sex so quickly. But before he can act, the boss slashes, saying the boy has no dignity. Jun hears the system's sound and the number of members drops to 99. 
He even thanks the boss for that. However, another guy says it's strange that Jun is angry. The boss helped by getting rid of that traitorous disciple. But before the guy can say anything else, he feels something odd. Jun had slipped past and struck him in the back, telling the boss that his disciple seemed rude, so he shouldn't be mad about that. However, a big guy approaches, saying Jun will pay with his life for that. Jun goes in to slash, and the brute comes to crush him. But the leader orders them to stop. Jem realizes from the guy's aura that this won't be an easy fight. The boss says he doesn't want to make a pile of corpses there. So Jun should just pay the 3,100 and disappear. Our boy is furious that this bastard only wants money and says he'll pay one coin. No negotiations. The boss is also losing his patience. The brute asks the boss to let him handle the boy, saying it will be great training. The boss agrees but warns him to be careful. The boy is fast. The brute laughs, saying it's impossible for anyone to be faster than him. He takes his stance and people recognize it as the seven steps of the shadow technique. Immediately, the guy's movements start to speed up. Jem realizes he's dealing with a weird speed type. Before Jun knows what to do, the guy is already behind him. He tries to attack, but Jun dodges, positions his blade where the guy would run, and catches him mid-run with a cut. Jem tells him it's foolish to be so fast if you can't see where you're going. At that moment, the other members rush toward him. Jun asks if they've given up on attacking one by one. Everyone slams the ground and he barely dodges, warning that it looks like he'll have to use his trump card. He accesses the system and pulls out the Calamity Saber. But he didn't expect this damn thing to be so small when he saw it in the system. The guys ask why he brought a toothpick to the fight. The boss, fed up, orders them to search his body already. Jun knows these elders are at level 12, so it won't be easy. That's when he uses the seal awakening to unlock the saber. An explosion bursts from his hand and the guys wonder what that light is. Even the boss can't believe the power is coming from the tiny blade. Maybe it's some kind of high-quality secret weapon. Suddenly, there's a blade right in his face. It wasn't a tiny knife, it was a 40-meter saber. The boss wonders what kind of pressure this is, every move feels like it could kill him. Our boy stands far away with the tiny knife pointed, impressed by the power of the Calamity Saber. 40 meters is incredibly long. The boss begs him to put away that weapon. They could discuss everything calmly. However, Jun says that once you draw a 40 meter blade, it's hard to put it back. And with that, he makes his move. The blade whips like a lash and takes out the elders beside the boss. The boss can't believe that two more were killed instantly. Jun just says he's alive because there's something he needs to ask. The rest of the sect members are all desperate, begging for forgiveness. But Jun questions whether the bodies of those he killed would like forgiveness. And what would the innocent souls think of that? Today was his chance to become death. He swings the blade again, whipping through everyone. He then says that only two are left and warns that the boss can run up to 39 meters away. The man falls to his knees, slams his face into the ground, and says he'll return all the disciples. The tiny blade hovers above his head, and Jun wants to know why the steel bone sect became his target. The man replies that he heard about their recruitment some time ago. However, Jun tells him to spill the truth quickly. He raises the sword, threatening that if he doesn't talk, you will die. The man screams, saying it was because of the Rising Water sect. He was paid to kill and kidnap the Steelbone disciples. Jun then simply says goodbye, and with that, a slash splits the base in half. Having killed more than 200 bandits, he earns 50 points from the system. The system also warns that due to prolonged use of the Calamity Saber, he will be forced to remain fatigued for 30 minutes. During his period, he has no strength or defense. Even a three-year-old could kill him. Our boy wonders why he wasn't warned about this earlier. He collapses to the ground, all twisted up, grateful they killed everyone. But he lies there quietly, saying that at least those guys can rest in peace now. Meanwhile, in front of the sect, King Ying asks what they'll do if Jun doesn't return. Kanshin says she'll become the new leader, and he the first disciple. She says it's not that bad, but maybe Jun has some sort of trump card. Suddenly, they get fright. Jun appears from afar, King Yang comes running relieved that Jun realized it would be too risky. However, Jun just says there are 30 disciples at the foot of the mountain, and they should send someone to help them up. Besides, he wasn't planning on renovating the courtyard. He throws down two bars of gold and tells them to use those. King Yang asks why he has gold and what happened to the people on the mountain. Jun just smiles and says they were all destroyed. Back at Black Mountain, the place is devastated. A servant says that from the wounds and shape of the cuts, it's clear everyone was killed by the same person. A man grins, saying that apparently there's a new legend in King Yang City. Back with Jun, he's eager to get something from the system. Unfortunately, there are no more techniques available to strengthen him. He can pay 10 contribution points to reset the shop, but he remembers that he's always been unlucky with Gaksha. But since it's the only option, he agrees and his contribution drops to 40. Here comes the little system. Our boy is sweating nervously. What appears is a primary technique of god level. He gets emotional and the system says the chance of it appearing is less than 1%. They gather the disciples in the hall and King Yang notes that Jun seems very happy. Our boy says it's because today they'll be planning the most important thing for the sect, the uniform. 
The two are confused by the so-called importance, but Jun says the design is ready and tells them to find a tailor in the city. King Yang questions if the most important thing isn't teaching cultivation techniques, or at least adjusting the part of the collar that was way too big. However, Jun tells him to shut up since he's not the boss. Besides, regarding cultivation techniques, he has an exclusive one, the Gaijing Scriptures. This is the god-level technique that the system unlocked, which enhances the body and cleanses the meridians. The system then announces that the requirements have been met, and the technique has been activated as the sex cultivation method. Only the leader and disciples can practice it. The two are baffled, wanting to know what that technique is. The system also says that if a disciple betrays the sect, joins another, or leaks the techniques, their memory will be erased. Hyar Moy gets excited, saying that this is true intellectual property protection. While he's on Cloud 9, King Yang keeps calling out to him. Jun says this was the technique he created, then starts making copies of the book and tells Kim Yang to distribute them to the other disciples. The two are confused about how this failed master created something like that. Hesitant, King Yang takes a copy to check it out. He realizes the technique is fabulous. It has the perfect balance of complexity and ease of understanding, much more advanced than what his father taught. It might even be a superior technique. Jun pats him on the shoulder and tells him to practice it too. However, Kanshin asks if she can ignore the techniques since the one she's practicing is better. Our boy steps closer, making her a little embarrassed. Jun leans in close and whispers in Kanshin's ear, telling her that if she's practicing something at the god level, then of course she can skip his technique. She runs off saying she'll take a look at it. Our boy thinks she's shyer than he imagined, while Qin Yang is struggling nearby. Jun asks what's wrong and Qin Yang replies that the technique is more complicated than he thought. The scene shifts to another part of the sect. Kanshin is looking at the pages. It seems simple, but in reality, it's extremely complex and truly at the god level. Perhaps the sect really does have an ancestral history, and this might be a lost technique. She takes a deep breath and starts practicing, feeling that if she masters it, she will finally achieve the revenge she seeks. Maybe she underestimated the leader of this place. Meanwhile, Jun is complaining that he's been practicing for an hour but hasn't learned anything. The system explains that because his spiritual root is still pretty mediocre, he can't comprehend much. Our boy asks if he's nothing without the system, which responds that it's obvious, but motivated. He says he doubts that he can't learn anything about the system. He'll train even if it takes a year. So if he starts practicing yoga poses, after two whole days, he finally learns the microcosmic orbit. With that, he gains some rewards for being independent. Our boy thinks that if the system rewards him for working hard, it's in trouble because he's a motivated guy. Just then, King Yang enters and announces that he has mastered the macrocosmic orbit, reminding Jun that he mastered the microcosmic one. The worst part is that it took him the same two days and the poor guy is exhausted. Jun tells him to get out of his room. Meanwhile, in another part of the sect, other people are practicing. The boy is excited to have finally reached level 4 only for another disciple to throw a pillow in his face, telling him he's the last in the entire place to learn this technique so he shouldn't get cocky. King Yang explains that many of the disciples are reaching levels 3, 4, and even 5. Having so many people getting stronger in the sect was truly incredible. However, Jun calls out his name and tells him that as the second disciple, he has to get used to this since that's how things will always be. Kin Yang says he understands and will continue guiding everyone, but as soon as he turns around, he starts celebrating. The level 2 technique is quite different, and now he can keep strengthening everyone, except one person. Another day of constant practice and he still can't level up. He's the only person in the entire sect whose practice isn't yielding any results. Then the system pops up, recommending a pill to help him. It's an energy-collecting pill that would increase his spiritual power fivefold for 24 hours, but it can only be used by the leader. Our boy thinks this is essential for getting stronger and immediately swallows it to start practicing. Right away, he feels a difference in the energy around him and is confident that he'll soon have enough to level up. He imagines that geniuses like King Yang must always feel like this, truly incredible. However, the system points out that with a superior route, King Yang absorbs energy much faster. Our boy tells the annoying system to get out of the way. The night falls and he spends the entire day practicing. Finally, he reaches the 11th level of opening and the system remarks that it's amazing how long it took him, even with the master's pill. Our boy ignores this and says that if there's a pill for the master, there must be one for the disciples. The system praises his deduction and says there's a formation that stays active 24 hours a day, but it can only be used by one person. Our boy thinks it's too expensive, considering it costs one point to keep active daily, he'll run out of money quickly. But the system insists that having strong disciples is the only way for the place to become more prominent. So Jun agrees and buys the disciples' formation. With that, the sex contribution drops to 30 and he receives a jar full of little flags. The instructions say he has to press a button for 3 seconds. Suddenly, someone bursts in, saying there's trouble at the entrance. Jun asks who it is, thinking it's the perfect time to earn more points. A kit comes at someone and a poor sect member is crushed. A man yells, asking how a beggar dared to steal pills from his family. Another guy with the fans says the boy's foundation is weak, but he's fast. 
and he had to chase him all the way to this trashy place and now plans to crush him to death. But then everyone shouts for them to stop. It's Jun who announces that this is Steelbone territory and demands to know what they're doing there. The fan guy asks if he's crazy for talking to him like that, and he immediately takes a kick to the face. The burly guy beside him couldn't believe the young master got beaten like that. Even Jun is confused, not entirely sure why he kicked the guy. The humiliated group asks how he dares strike the young master. Jun asks if his family is really that powerful. Or at least do they have enough power to go against the entire sect. Jun is proud, after everyone leveled up, they seem more united. King Yang then warns that the kid's family is the biggest supplier of energy pills in the city. The guy who got kicked in the face asks how Jun dares hit the youngest member of the high family. He demands to see the sect leader and wants everyone there to kneel and apologize. Our boy simply says there's no need to call the leader because he's that guy. But the men keep looking around, asking when the leader will show up and stop sending these lackeys. Jun grabs him by the collar and asks if he doesn't see the leader right in front of him. He throws the guy to the ground and orders them to leave the mountain. The young master says fine, they'll come back for revenge. After they take him away, Jun asks Xing Yang if he doesn't look like a sect leader. Sometime later, they see the boy who was beaten, now with another broken rib. The boy won't survive even if a doctor arrives, there's only one way to save him, the legendary pill from ancient times. Kanshin asks if he thinks it's child's play to keep asking for it every time. Jun admits that he does have one more pill in hand. Should he save the guy or not? King Yang says yes, but Kanshin says no and Jun finds it all interesting. King Yang argues that saving people is the greatest virtue of all, but Shanshin counters that in Starry Land, countless people are dying. Is he going to save everyone? Jem responds that King Yang is too precious with his kindness, but sometimes reality is cruel. When he handed over the pill, he didn't know the effect would be so strong. But now that he knows, he decided not to use it on people he doesn't know. King Yang asks if Jun regrets saving him. Jun says no, because by saving him, the boy joined his sect. He pulls out another pill and says he understands. He hopes it brings in another talented disciple, someone who will achieve great things. Kanshin questions if he really thinks everyone will be as talented as King Yang. Jun replies that it will depend on luck. The boy swallows the pill and starts coughing. Jun explains that he used a very rare pill to save him, but the guy interrupts, asking if he's Mr. Jun before Jun can say anything. The boy kneels and begs to be accepted. Jun says he was about to ask him that, but it seems he summed up the story. The boy introduces himself as Zuji, a direct descendant of the Xiao family from Liang City. King Yang seems to recognize the boy's name, saying he's also a rare talent with a superior root, the strongest descendant of that entire city, a name known to everyone there. Or at least he was, since his root fell to the inferior level. Something strange happened to his internal energy, and all his talent was lost. Because of this, even his wife left him, and he was humiliated. The Xiao family then considered him a disgrace and expelled him. Jun says Zuji has a talent for storytelling, but is excited that the guy is a loser. He's the perfect person to help find his talent again. Zuji asks if he would really accept someone like him. Jun looks confused and says, of course not. Zuji trembles, saying he expected he wasn't worthy of being a disciple of this place, and with that, he leaves, apologizing for everything. King Yang tries to tell him to stay and get stronger in the sect, but Jun tells him to be quiet and tells Zuji to jump off the mountain in front of the sect if he wants to find new opportunities. The boy replies that since losing his talent, he's never had an opportunity. But Jun says opportunities come to those who are prepared. No one chooses to be strong, but they can choose to be resilient. He asked if the boy didn't manage to exist when he was abandoned by his wife or when he was kicked out of his family. Didn't he want to turn things around and tell these people to their faces that he changed? Jun then says that's all. If the boy wants to leave, he should just leave. Once again, the boy falls to the ground, saying he wants to reclaim everything he lost and join the sect. Jun says he seems to have been depressed for a long time. It's time to reach for his former glory. A while later, Jun's alone in his room. It won't be easy to rebuild the confidence of someone who lost it all. The system suggests that maybe this guy is just another waste of space, since the sect is already full of people without talent. Jun asks if it's not an honor to train someone from weak to strong. At least he earned five points for recruiting the guy. He then says they've reached 100 members again and asks if they can now take on the mission. The system confirms that he has collected points, has 100 members, and they are all in the sect. The mission was about to begin, or rather, a bunch of tasks the sect had to complete. Our boy asks what kind of mission is this filled with domestic chores. The system says he can upgrade and take on more difficult tasks if he wants. Jun says that growing vegetables or cleaning the floor is indeed great practice for the disciples. He immediately yells for King Yang, telling him to gather everyone. Time passes and now people are sweeping the floor. Some are rescuing cats from trees and others are hauling water. Even Chang Chin doesn't understand how she ended up writing letters for old men. She was tricked by that rascal who told her that the essence of cultivation lay in the importance of daily work. She looks at an old man and asks what he wants her to write, but the guy can't hear well so she has to shout it out. 
King Yang is just watching the chaos, wondering what the leader is thinking. Back in his room, Jun even sneezes from so many people cursing him and tells the system that it better be worth the point he spent. In front of him stands a metallic punching bag. The system says this machine is perfect for testing his and the disciples' growth. Jun says, fine then, I'll test it, and lands a solid punch. The system announces that his strike carries 900 kilograms of force. Usually, someone with 11 circles of opening hits around 750. Suddenly, someone calls out his name with a deep and intense voice. Jun knows it must be one of his enemies. He turns to Changshin and asks if she heard someone with a deep and sexy voice calling him. She shouts again. It was obviously her. She asks why she has to write letters for old men all day. He asks her to be gentle again, but it's clear the boy got beaten. A little while later, Jun says the design of the uniforms is perfect since it reflects the sex temperament. King Yang says they'll talk about the uniforms later. First, he wants to know what happened to the leader's face. Jun replies that he was practicing the scriptures and went too far. Chanshin, with her deep voice, says she hates the color red, and Kim Yang wonders who shouted that because it didn't sound like her. Jun tells him to bring her a white outfit and asks if she'll be satisfied with that. She's all grumpy, trying to contain her anger. Jun finds it strange, it doesn't seem like it's just about not liking a color. Soon enough, you might discover a bit more about her past. At that moment, disciple Suksa Elmo says that the guy from the High family is in front of the sect. Jun says the guy took his time and receives a mission to teach him a lesson. At the front of the sect, Jun tells the man he's polite for having waited so long, but the man just asks if he's the leader of that place and introduces himself as Hai Shank, an elder of the Hai family. Jun asks if he's here because Suksa Elmo was beaten, and the man confirms. Jun explains that the guy was causing trouble in front of the sect for the disciples, so he taught him a lesson. The man then asks if his disciples were the ones stealing pills. They could let the pill incident slide, but not the fact that Jun beat up Heizu. The only way to resolve it was for Jun to break his own legs and arms. Jun claps his hands and says he's welcome to challenge him in the training field whenever he wants. That to him would be a courtesy. The two of them head straight to the field. No time to waste. The old man says he admires that someone as weak as Jun had the courage to challenge him, but the sect members seem to trust Jun since he took down the bandit leader. The old man asks what he's hearing about Jun single-handedly defeating those bandits. Apparently, he was lying to all the disciples just to earn a reward of a thousand coins. Jun is confused, he didn't even know there was such a reward. Shank draws his weapon and asks if Jun is ready. Jun simply asks if he's heard that in martial arts, speed is the most important thing. The man moves much faster than him and slashes at his leg and arm, turning around saying that speed is his motto. However, Jun asks what he's doing there. Confused, the old man says he just cut him. How is he still standing? But what he sees is just an illusion of June, the old man quickly backs off, shouting that the boy is using black magic. Jun tells him to pay attention and not blink. In a second, Jun's behind him again and asking if he saw. The old man tries to strike, asking what kind of magic this it is. Jun says it's not magic, it's speed. This technique is called the Phantom Step. The sect members are trying to figure out what their wicked leader is doing and why it seems like there are multiple leaders on the field. The old man questions if the illusions are created because of the speed he moves. Jun appears behind him again, saying the technique isn't that great and kicks him on the butt. The old man falls to the ground, and just as he turns to curse, Jun is already behind him again and lands another kick on his rear. Jun explains that the intention of this move isn't to hurt but to humiliate. The disciples wonder if their leader has some strange preferences. Shang starts getting angry, saying this is impossible and asking how Jun dares to humiliate him like this. He immediately uses a technique that causes a web to fall on Jun. However, Jun just watches the web fall, thinking it's boring. He reappears in front of Shank and asks if he thinks it's right for them to continue this fight. That was worth it. Jun gained 50 contribution points. He realizes that the greater the difference in power, the more points he earns. The Elder humbly thanks him for his kindness, and Jun says that things should end there since it was his disciple's fault for stealing the pills. His disciple got beaten just like Zhao, so they can call it even. The old man says it's crazy how the young have so much energy and love to fight. It's not something the elders should get involved in. With that, he's already fleeing the sect, thinking that Jun is far more dangerous than he imagined. He plans to warn the leaders not to make an enemy of him. With speed like that, he could even kill a martial master. The scene shifts to a part of the forest where a couple is together, and the guy says he missed her a lot. He leans in sweetly for a kiss when he hears a noise and sees Jun up in a tree, drawing. He drops his paper and runs to the city in a panic. As someone who's always been a virgin, Jun's main objective is to ruin couples. Right now, he's sprinting to the city to claim the reward for killing the bandits. He arrives a minute after the old man leaves the sect and immediately announces that the leader of the Steel Bone sect is there to collect the reward for taking down the bandits. The guy tells him to get in line with the others who claim they killed those guys too. Jun looks over and sees Frieza, Orochimaru, a Jojo character, and Satama. Suddenly, a shout comes from inside, ordering everyone to leave. Our boy is impressed because the shout alone was so powerful. Maybe it was the city lord, but he still wants the reward because he's a greedy capitalist. 
Mustering up his courage, he introduces himself and says he's there to see the Lord. From a distance, a voice says he heard about what happened at the recruitment, so Jun is invited inside. Jun enters the Lord's hall and stands face to face with the throne. The Lord says he's been eager to meet Jun, calling him a talented young man, just as he expected. But what's this about being there for the reward? Jun explains that he's the one who destroyed the entire Black Mountain sect. A man beside the Lord tells Jun to stop lying because, with his level of power, it's impossible. He asks if Jun is just there to steal their money. Jun asks Lord C who these weirdos are. The Lord explains that they're two elders from the Rising Water sect. Our boy knows these are his enemies who have been after him. The Lord asks if Jun can prove he wiped out the mountain's occupants. Jun says he climbed the mountain alone and killed over 200 so no one saw him do it. The elders are convinced this rascal is lying. But Jun smiles and says he brought evidence. He then throws his sword on the ground and right away the guys recognize it. That was the green dragon sword that the bandit used. In an accident, he had broken it. But luckily, the system is kind and fixed it with just one point. Now the fools are sweating cold, wondering if he really did all this on his own. And C smiles, saying this proves he dealt with those guys and asks for more details. At that moment, the side mission to convince that chief activates and there's nothing easier for Jun than to show off. Or better yet, to tell a true story. He says everyone should know that it's impossible for him to kill such a large gang all by himself. C then asks who helped him. He says it wasn't a person but spirits. And to be more specific, they were the spirits of the ancestors of the Steel Bone sect. Even though they had lost the glory of the past, the ancestors still existed. And whenever he's in danger, they provide him with great strength. Jun knows he's just an amateur, so he has to say something that they can't verify. And at the moment, the guys don't believe it. Obviously saying he's making up a bunch of stories. They tell Mr. Xi that it's foolish to believe in that. Sig responds, asking Jun to demonstrate this so-called spiritual connection. A guy steps forward, saying he'd be willing to fight the boy to make him use those spirits. He's just a young martial arts apprentice, so he believes Mr. Jun won't be scared. Jun asks the system how much longer his ability will work, and it replies 20 minutes. He then says he accepts, saying he'll have enough time to deal with those guys. The scene shifts to the training ground outside. The guy with the whip says it's going to be dangerous and asks Jun if he's ready. He's excited because the guys from the mountain couldn't kill that guy. He'll take care of this job. At that moment, C from the side asks if Jun already has the spirits prepared. He says yes and is about to say the spirits' names. But the guy interrupts saying it doesn't matter and tells him to go to hell. However, Jun stomps on the ground and says that it's called Light Cut. He warns that Mr. Wei had connections with the mountain bandits but should have thought better about how this would end. As he is startled by the speed. In a second, Jun is already behind the other servant. Manny quickly finishes off another and says that anyone who tries to kill him will face death as punishment. The guys fall to the ground and our boy asks Mr. Xi to have the servants clean up the place. A while later, the guy throws a coin at him, which he catches and thanks him for the reward. With the bandit's reward and resources from the other sex people he killed, he finally has money. Mr. Xi says he wants to thank him since those guys have been causing problems for many years. A system then congratulates him for completing the mission and he gains 10 more contribution points. He then leaves saying it was no big deal since he's also a citizen of this city. Xi reminds him that he just killed two elders of the Rising Water sect and now has become a sworn enemy. But Jun just responds that they wouldn't leave him alone even if he hadn't done it. And he leaves saying he's not afraid of anything since if they provoke him again, he'll kill whoever they send next. A servant stops beside Xi and says that from what he saw in the arena, Jun really must have killed the mountain sect. The chief already knows that this boy was hiding his power with that spirit story, and it seems he thought the leader of that place was as naive as a three-year-old. However, it's undeniable that perhaps the Steel Bones sect really does have a centenary history, and considering how motivated he seemed, it would be better to be friends with this guy, who was walking around the city drooling over the 50,000 he received when someone came running from behind. He was eager to go to a restaurant and eat the best food in the city since he had been starving for a long time. When the girl headbutts him in the back, startling the poor guy, he turns around and asks who did that. But then he notices it was a little girl now holding her head in pain. With tears in her eyes, she asks if he's Mr. June. At that moment, a crowd tells her to stay put right there. Not only had she eaten without paying the bill, but she had also insulted the owner. However, Jun draws a blade and tells the guy to stay quiet. He says it wasn't appropriate for the old man to treat the girl badly. The guy responds that it really isn't right and starts cursing his friends. Jun then says he'll give them three minutes. Before he could finish talking, the guys had already disappeared. The girl then thanks him for his help. He tells her not to worry and says he's heading back to the sect. Suddenly, she hugs him and asks if she can also join the Steel Bone sect. She introduces herself as Liu Wanshi. Her surname is Dudu, and she's an obedient girl who wants to join his sect. He apologizes and taps her head, warning her that the sect isn't recruiting disciples at the moment. However, she starts crying desperately. He is a bit confused by that and asks her to stop as he gets drenched in tears. Right then, everyone in the city says that Jun from the Steel Bone sect makes little kids cry. 
Seeing her so distressed, he tells her to stop crying and come back with him. In a second, she's 100% prepared again. She says she's starving and asks if they could stop at the restaurant first. She starts ordering smoked pork with honey, fried chicken, roast beef, and a juju cake. He tells her to shut up and asks how many dishes she knows from that place. Then she gets ready to cry again. He says it's fine, and now they're at the restaurant. All happy that he's finally eating something good. However, she starts complaining that the vegetables weren't fresh and the fish was too salty. Besides that, the dumplings have been overcooked. Our boy asks who complains so much with six dishes beside them. He explains that people in extreme hunger don't care about food quality. He responds that it seems she knows how to cook. She pauses for a second and says that in that world, no one is better than her in the kitchen since she knows all the dishes. If chefs were ranked like cultivators, she would be a master. Chum questions if she's really that good. She says if he doubts her, she'll show him what real food is when they get back to the sect. However, for that to happen, the poor guy had to buy a cow, a bunch of vegetables, and he returned with a chicken on his head. She also says they'll need to build a pond, a vegetable area, and a place to raise cattle there. He tells her not to worry, he will definitely get all that done. While Manier was dripping on his head, as they were nearing the sect, she was just motivating the leader to bring everything. He started calling the members to rescue the leader, but then he noticed something and wondered who that guy was. While a guy in a hat was standing in front of the sect, the members began arriving. He passed the load to them and asked who the guy in the hat was. The poor guy was obviously crushed. They said he'd been there for about eight hours, saying he wanted to challenge the master of that place. Jun says if he's been there that long, at least he has willpower. However, when he gets closer, he sees that the guy was snoring. The bastard was sleeping while standing. The scene changes to the sex kitchen. King Yang was the former chef and says that Dudu is very young, so can she really cook? No one could compare to the cosmic noodles he made. Jun asks how he dares to take pride in making noodles. He had to take a look at her knife skills. And with that, she starts slicing the carrot into a thousand little pieces. She throws them into the pan and everything into the cauldron. Dinner was served. Everyone in the sect was eating, saying it was delicious. Even the former incompetent chef admitted that stuff was really good. And Jun said she was indeed better than the chef at the Moon Star restaurant. She says it's because he's just a regular cook while she's a senior. And once she reaches the highest level, her food will be able to enhance their power. Jun asks if that's true. She says yes and asks if she can stay in the Steel Bone sect. He replies that of course she can or else he'll start a revolt and keep starving. Later that night, Kanchin was sitting on the roof, observing that it was a full moon again. At that moment, Jun approached and said it was getting late. How would she manage tomorrow's tasks? He asked if something was on her mind. If she said so, she might feel better. She says she's not worried about anything. She just came to look at the moon. Then the two fall silent. Kanchin says that Liu Wanshi, the doo-doo he recruited, is not an ordinary girl. As far as she knows, only people from the Oyang Imperial family could make food that could enhance power. Our boy thinks that this Imperial thing is amazing. He says her name is an Oyang, and Qianqin says she might have just lied. He asks if maybe she's hiding her identity like Qianqin. At that moment, she stands up and says she has to go. But our boy tells her to remember. She will always be the first disciple of the Steel Bone sect. So if she has any enemies, she doesn't need to act alone and do something stupid. She pauses for a second, and Jun says she doesn't need to worry because he will help her. Ah, she blushes, wanting to know what he's talking about. He says it's nothing special. It's just that the moon was beautiful. The next morning, our boy was walking around the sect, singing songs, all happy because he had earned money. When suddenly, the door explodes. Someone steps on it, and the guy introduces himself as Yongming, the wandering swordsman. Our boy says he's the guy who was there to challenge him and asks why he kicked the door. The guy says that sometimes he wakes up angry. Jun starts drawing his sword, saying it's a coincidence. Sometimes in the morning, he also wakes up angry and likes a fight to calm down. Yangming smiles and says that's exactly what he wants. And Jun tells him to come at him already and stop wasting time. Man, the guy really went in without fear. And with that, they exchanged the first strike. Yangming said he didn't have the power of even a martial artist. And of the last 30 he had challenged, this Jun was the weakest. However, our boy was smiling, eager to activate the Nine Swords technique. With that, he swings a slash toward Yangming, who then realizes it wasn't going to be that easy. The blade along with the cape had been cut in half. And Jun says that the cultivation stage doesn't really represent someone's strength. He tells him to come back to challenge him when he understands those words. At that moment, Yanning falls to his knees, and Jun tells him not to say anything else until he fixes that door. With that, he goes back inside, wondering why he encountered a maniac so early in the morning. The system says he has 86 points, and maybe he'd feel better after some shopping. Our boy says it's really a good idea to start spending a lot, and with that, he starts buying a bunch of stuff. Finally, he had two tools to save his life. One of them was a power that increased his strength fitfold for 60 minutes. However, he had to be careful not to break his bones. Considering that one punch of his had a force of a thousand kilos, with this it would go up to about 5,000. But much more impressive was this other thing. Man, what is this? The boy pulled out a desert eagle out of nowhere. He even says the times had changed. That weapon was adapted for the cultivator's world and used energy to fire shots. 
However, it's not very good at long distances. He removes the magazine and sees that apparently he'll have to reload it with crystal cores. He has fun with the gun, but he knows that each shot would cost at least a thousand coins. That's when he remembers he had a mission to accept. He had to help the villagers of King Yang to eradicate the flame wolf. It was thanks to the disciples that he had reached 70 points, so it would be good to buy some equipment for them. But of course, as a leader, he has to charge his price. The system says the poor guys had to keep feeding pigs and cleaning trash. It would be inhumane not to give anything to the boys. Shen says he already understood this damn system and will buy some decent items. He calls for King Yang, who gathers the top four there, and he says they will all receive a dose of an elixir that will increase their energy. After they consume it, their energy accumulation speed will be twice as fast as normal, and the effect lasted an incredible 12 hours. King Yang knows that this type of item is usually given in a level 5 sect, so why did he have something like that? Our boy made the purchase of the stock and tells him to distribute it to everyone who completed the mission. Someone responds that they paid me his share. The boy warns that he hasn't reached the point of being able to absorb the energy, so it would be a waste, or it's better to give it to someone else. Our boy says that he's always fair, so he deserves it. Besides, he will help him with this issue of not having any power. He then calls for Xiaomo and King Yang, saying that due to their excellent performance, they will also receive equipment. The ice sword would go to King Yang, as he was a promising junior, and Xiaomo would get the wooden sword because he's a very creative boy. Despondent, he asks what that disgrace would do. He makes a slash, but Jun tries to make him stop. With that, it sends out an aura that slices a pillar in half, and King Yang says that this wooden sword strangely doesn't seem weaker than the other one. Our boy tells them to be careful and says that there's a mission for everyone. He explains about the arrival of the flame wolf and warns that they will have to go there to eradicate that creature. King Yang says that a creature like that compared to an apprentice-level martial artist wouldn't be easy. Shen responds not to worry because he'll be right behind watching everything, and tells the damn Xiaomo that when he gets back he has to fix that pillar or he'll get a beating. The scene shifts to the wolf's valley where there's a flame wolf and everything is quite obvious. They stealthily approach. King Yang gives all the directions and little by little, they surround the creature. The moment it hears something, Jung shouts for them to attack. He says they can do it, but the group freezes. The tiger wakes up and roars. Xiaomo asks why Jun is so far away and why he shouted to attack the beast. Jun explains that he's right behind them and that he only shouted because the beast had already noticed their presence. With that, strangely, they assume a mobile game stance and start charging forward. King Yang is all confused, with Jun telling him to be more flexible and take advantage of the beast's cooldown time. They had to know how to play as a team and keep the right focus on the creature. And remember that they were three DPS without any tank or healer. King Yang was thinking about this business of not having a healer. She was almost dying. And Jun was yelling at Xiaomo to stop using normal attacks and activate his skills already. When a hole appeared beside him, Kanshin apologizes, saying it was an accident. And Jun says he understands. He'll stop passing on strategies. He tells everyone to just continue the fight now. With that, Kanshin throws herself at the tiger. Jun knew she had some kind of secret martial art that might even be at the god level. However, at that moment, her back was exposed. But Xiaomo takes advantage and hits the monster right in the chin. But unfortunately, the attack couldn't penetrate the skin. He runs desperately, saying that hitting with a piece of wood doesn't count. As he flees, Kanshin approaches from above. She lands right on the beast's back and slashes its neck. That one did manage to hurt, but it wasn't enough. He then shouts for Kanshin, and with that, the two charge together. Once again, the tiger prepares an explosion. But before it can finish, the two slash together. And with that, the creature's head falls to the ground. Man, the thing rolled far away. Jun grabs it and destroys it in the middle, saying he got a crystal. Exhausted, Xiaomo asks if they fought well. Jun says their synergy at the end of the fight wasn't bad. And Kanshin says it's all thanks to the weapons he gave. Then Xiaomo complains, saying he still feels like he's burning after that attack. And Jun says something was wrong. He was also feeling a strange heat. Apparently, there was more than one flame wolf. At that moment, something steps on his back. And another creature starts approaching. This was a flame wolf king. Kanshin warns that it's a 7th grade creature much stronger than the previous one. Now they were definitely in trouble. Kanshin tells everyone to run while he buys them time. He just wanted them to tell his father that he got a hero. Jun tells him to stop with that nonsense and says there's no reason to be so serious. They should always remember the first commandment of the Steel Bone sect. They didn't have to take anything too seriously and only beat up those they didn't like. The two look at each other, wondering if it wasn't about recovering the objective ancestral spirits. Until Jun tells them to shut up and says it doesn't matter because he just changed it. Besides, he had been practicing his reloading skill a lot. He ejects the magazine and inserts the spiritual stone he just received. With that, the number 7 appears. And he already says goodbye to that creature. With that, he pulls the trigger. And everyone stares because nothing happened. Then the beast starts spitting fire and he wonders why the system lied like that. That's when the system says he didn't activate the bullets. So he pulls the gun back to let the bullets enter, turns to the shot, and says it's the second goodbye. But again, that damn thing fails. And he starts running. The group wonders what this crazy leader is doing. 
A system tells him to stop being so hasty and listen before acting. He also had to remove the safety lock. He then jumps, says he's trusting the system, and says it was fun. Now it was the third goodbye. Finally, the bullet fired. And man, it hit the monster right in the face. The impact was so strong that Jum was even thrown. The monster ended up with a crater on its forehead and fell dead. The guys were shocked. What kind of weapon kills a beast with one shot? Kanchin was in shock when Jun shouted from the background, telling her not to stand there. They were supposed to collect the crystals now and help him get up. The poor guy couldn't move. The recoil from that damn weapon was too strong. They approach, and he says he wouldn't suffer so much if at least one of them were a healer. With that, she pushes his arm up. The poor guy screams and the birds fly away. Back at the sect, he tells the system that it's not working like this. That weapon hurt him more than it hurt the enemy. If he misses the shot, the opponent will finish him off. The system says it's his fault for being so weak that he can't use it properly. That Desert Eagle had a recoil like a cannon since it used crystal bullets. He should be happy to have a product that fits him perfectly. The scene shifts to the training room, and Jun asks if that's the muscle building room the system made him spend 20 points on. That damn thing was just a tent. The system responds that when he tries it out, he'll finally understand. He should go right in and take a look. Seeing that it was a massage chair, he gets excited. Strengthening the body while being massaged would be great. With that, the tent closes and a two-minute timer starts. Jun is all excited, saying it's so comfortable inside. Until suddenly, his feet and hands are restrained. His torso is also locked and he already has a bad feeling. Then a part of the tent opens up and punches him in the cheek. He's confused, wondering what the heck that was. The system says that human skin is like acid and becomes more resistant the more it's tempered. That's how the muscle building room works. He says he's been tricked and orders the system to let him out immediately. However, the system responds that actually he will have to stay there for at least two hours. And with that, the poor guy is beaten, all cursing the system to the heavens. Time passes and the poor guy keeps getting beaten. Finally, it reaches zero and he manages to get out. Exhausted, he says he's this close to killing the system. The system was about to say that with great power comes great responsibility. But Jun punches it and tells it to shut up. However, the punch lands right on the power meter. And this time, it shows 1900. He's impressed since yesterday it was only 925. Apparently, this room was effective. That's when he hears some strikes nearby. One of the sex trees is just shaking. It's Zuji, throwing a bunch of punches Rock Lee style. Joan approaches and asks if the boy didn't understand the scriptures he gave him. Zuji says he understood, but even after two days of practicing absorption power, he still doesn't have any spiritual energy. If even a god-level technique isn't working on him, it seems he was destined not to be a cultivator. Our boy tells him not to be so sad. He says he doesn't have to worry because he's discovered a new cultivation path just for him. The path of body strengthening. Zuji turns around, excited, and asks if it's true. But he gets a fright when he sees the boy all beaten up. Jun just says that soon he'll know. With that, the time in the beating chamber starts ticking away. Four total hours of suffering. Jun asks Zuji how he's feeling, and asks if maybe it's his punishment for not knowing how to gather energy. Our boy says he's jumping to conclusions too soon. Soon he'll feel the new strength. Zuji says it's impossible. He can't even beat a first-level opening child. He presses his feet to the ground to stand up and say he's tired of this. However, he ends up throwing himself far away. He tells Jun that he's stronger and asks if he can start cultivating now. Our boy says this place will make him stronger. However, he'll have to spend at least eight hours a day there. With that, the poor guy was beaten, and our boy says he'll need to get a new one of those for them. In the following days, they were both worn out all the time. The intersect accepted everyone and heard the poor guy screaming. Some time later, Zuji threw a punch, and now he already had 300 strength. The friends didn't understand how a boy who had never cultivated or awakened had more power than someone at level two. Ken Yang asks if he was born strong like that, and he says it's thanks to the leader's special training. He even said he benefited a lot from it himself. Jun opens his eyes, saying he's finally done. The system informs him that he's reached the 12 point opening, and now he's qualified to accept epic missions. The city of Qin Yang is going to hold a set competition in 10 days, and he has to bring five disciples to participate. To be considered a victory, any one of the disciples has to reach the top three. However, he realizes that this time the reward is performance based, and he already wants to know how much he'd earn if all the top three were his disciples. The system says he's excited, but he must know that failing an epic mission has severe consequences. If he doesn't win, he won't be able to increase his power for the next 10 years. He already knows that if something like that happens, his plans will all fall apart, and he shouts the names of the five disciples for everyone to hear. Trying to hold back laughter, he tells everyone there will be a competition in 10 days. Everyone's worn out, and Kim Yang says that only advanced sex participate, so they have no chance at all. However, Jun says he's sure they're working hard to evolve their bodies, and that's why he's going to register them, and he wants them all to make it to the top three. The group is shocked. Even Kanchin says something like that would be very difficult. He says that's what makes it a challenge and warns that in the next 10 days, he's going to help them train even more. This was a collection of items that would double their cultivation. He tells Chanchin to stay there the entire time since she already had a lot of practice. 
King Yang and Shaoma were to spend half the time there and half in the bodybuilding room. Zuji is just hesitating on the side, and Jun says this will happen in the city of Liang, his hometown where he was removed and humiliated. So aside from three meals, he's supposed to be in the muscle room training for the next 10 days. However, Zuji replies that he'll only have one meal and won't leave the training room. Jun says it's good to hear that. He tells him to train harder than ever, and in 10 days, even without cultivation, he would be comparable to a genius. Already in the city of Liang, Jun is registering his sex name. The official then asks for the age and name of everyone. However, he seems to tremble when asking about Xiao Zuji. Wasn't he the loser descendant who was expelled from the Xiao family? Jun says if he repeats that again, he'll die. The official just replies, telling them to be there on time, or they'll be disqualified. On Zuji's registration, it's written that he's a direct descendant of the Xiao family. However, our boy says he doesn't want that title anymore. From today on, his only title is a disciple of the Steel Bone sect. Inside the Xiao mansion, a man says it seems like they're trying to humiliate their family. How could a loser like that join this year's competition? He should have followed the elder's advice and poisoned that boy. That way, he'd have joined his parents in hell by now. Exhausted, Zuji steps out of the tent. One step outside, he takes a deep breath and punches the robot. Judd notices that although he has no talent, the boy worked harder than ever and was already heading back to the tent. Every minute that passed, he was getting stronger and would show everyone what he was capable of that day. But if those Xiao family members try anything, he will put an end to it. Meanwhile, another sect member completes a mission of delivering water, reaching 100% completion. Now the sect's constructions have advanced to level 2 and he has unlocked the medicine refining tower. Our boy is all excited. Finally, he could start creating some things. Looking at the recipe to create a medicine pill, he had everything but was missing a flame. The system said that in that world there are many types of flames and he could buy one in the shop. It showed him the Linglong flame and said it cost 50 contribution points and was of the highest quality. Our boy says he only has 62 points, could he get a discount? But suddenly, he receives a notification and a side mission is activated. He had to kill the three assassins sent after him. He's furious at this turn of events. He pulls out his desert eagle and wonders where those bastards are. He hears footsteps above and knows they're on the roof. Man, he aims and shoots, hitting the first one instantly. The poor guy was thrown upwards. The other two are terrified, having not even moved yet. With no options, they jump down in front of Jun. One pulls out some blades and says Jun is going to hell, but he's disintegrated as well. Jun apologizes and tells the other to repeat himself because the shot happened at the same time, and he didn't hear it. Could you please say the same words as his friend? The poor guy starts crying in fear. Suddenly, the disciples enter, saying they heard gunshots in the sect. Our boy is talking, hands on his head and lying on the ground. If he tells the truth, he might get out alive. He doesn't even need to say anything because Jun already knows who sent him. He's sure the guy was sent by the Rising Water sect people. Seeing that the guy hesitated, Jun is certain it was those bastards. As soon as the competition is over, he's going to destroy those guys. With that, the mission is complete, and he earns 30 contribution points. Jun is all excited. If it weren't for the muscle training room, he wouldn't have been able to fire the gun like that. He then spends 50 contribution points to buy the high-quality flame. Finally, it was time to make some pills. He needed to help his disciples recover and get stronger. After all, he was starting to worry about what would happen on that day. Night falls, and he enters the tent, saying this is what's making him the most insecure. He had been trying to find ways to make himself stronger. That muscle-building pill could directly strengthen the body. Ten days pass, and our boy arrives with his disciples looking all stylish. However, the city folk are already commenting on what the Xiao family's loser was doing there. Maybe he had developed a spell to take a beating from others. Kaisaomo appears in front, asking how they have the nerve to talk like that about his friend. And he starts beating everyone, saying they were asking for it. The guys are scared, because the kid is fast. Jem praises him, saying it was a great job. The people already imagine he must be the strongest disciple of that sect. He's probably the famous Lai Qinyang, the strongest there. An old man nearby says that this boy named Qinyang is very agile and powerful. They shouldn't underestimate him. A red-haired guy says he's also a genius and isn't afraid of that boy. And someone asked if they were surprised. It was Linny, another descendant of the same Xiao family. He mentioned that he was in the Simsong sect, a level 6 sect, unlike their level 9 trash. Clearly, it was a waste of anything the family had spent on him. He was the true future of the Xiao family and had already reached the first level of opening. Fa'elmo was about to say something, but Jum told him to keep quiet. Zuji simply said Linny's name. He warned him that the fact he was the older brother would never change. The boy was impressed that he couldn't lift his shoulder. Zuji put him on his knees, saying that even without any spiritual root or cultivation base, he would always be under his shadow. At that moment, the announcements started being made in the city. Everyone was to head to the auditoriums and the participants were to start preparing. From above, someone was watching Zuji and wondering why that trash had appeared there. It was the great elder of the Xiao family who knew it would be a disgrace for everyone. From a distance, he wondered if that was the leader who was helping this failure. And our very modern boy said to be careful or he would put a bullet in his head. The old man had no idea what that gesture meant. 
It was clear. It was probably a sign that he had a mental problem, which was why he accepted the loser. 200 people were in that competition, and to prevent disciples of the same sect from facing each other, they were all divided into four groups. The first fight would be Tian Ki of the Steel Bone Sect against San Kai of the Red Gate Sect. Shin Ki was impressed that the guy was gigantic. Someone approached Zuji and told him not to worry. Sekai was already at the 12th level of opening, but he would go easy on the boy, so there was nothing to worry about. Zuji being naive thanked him. With that, the signal to start was given. As soon as the whistle blew, Chi and Ki teleported and punched San Kai in the stomach. The poor fat guy was thrown against the wall, and leader Liu didn't know how that happened. Shin Ki apologized, he knew the plan was for everyone to pretend to be weak, but even at minimal strength, he ended up doing that. Liu said it seemed like Jun had invested a lot in the boy, and our boy said he just got lucky. But he was eager for his disciples to show what they were capable of. In match 32, Xiaomo easily defeated his opponent, and the old man discovered that the guy at the gate wasn't King Yang. Of course, King Yang himself defeated his opponent extremely easily, and Kanshin didn't even leave her spot. Liu didn't understand why this boy's apprentices were defeating everyone so easily, and Jun was angry that none of these guys were holding back their strength. In the audience, people were even saying that the matches of the Steel Bones sect were kind of boring, until it was Zuji's turn. A guy with a ponytail said he was really lucky. He never imagined he would face the so-called great genius. As soon as the fight started, he disappeared and said it would be over quickly. The attack hit Zuji squarely. The guy told him to stop acting tough because he knew he had destroyed his shoulder. However, Zuji said that this attack, compared to the bodybuilding room, was very light. The guy had no idea what this bodybuilding thing was. And Zuji just shoulder slammed the guy, who was thrown far away. Man, the boy had destroyed the guy's arm. And the people in the audience were all shocked. With that, he was announced as the winner of the fight. Five disciples advanced to the second round, and the task was considered 10% complete with 20 contribution points. Our boy was excited. It wasn't that difficult to complete this epic mission. The biggest problem was the elder of the Xiao family. The moment Zuji defeated his opponent, that guy seemed to get even angrier, so he would have to take precautions. The fat guy asked Jun why he's playing with that toy in his hand instead of watching the match. He admitted that this Qian Qi was quite impressive. Even without using any spiritual energy, he was winning. In the middle of the fight, there was an exchange of punches, and Liu knew that each punch from that guy weighed 750 kilograms. So how was this Tian Kai surviving? Then the guy in the arena was pushed. He warned that he would now activate his powers to break that barrier. With that, he charged in with a fiery aura. The palm came and Qian Qi dodged. He grabbed the guy's arm and asked what nonsense this breaking defense was. He twisted the poor guy's wrists and said he had no chance. With that, Tian Kai won another match. Sometime later, it was the end of the second round. Five more disciples had advanced to the third, and he had completed another 10%. Li was praising the teacher's abilities and Jun for having even taught Zuji. Our boy says the boy was already a genius. It's just a pity Xiao family didn't recognize him. Meanwhile, Xiao family chief is trembling. He knows the damn kid had strength in his body, but humans have limits. However, the next opponent wasn't someone who could be defeated with just a strong body. The sixth fight of the third round was Zuji against a boy named A Kin. The guy praised Zuji but asked that his body could withstand purple flames. The old man was smiling since fire cultivators are the weakness of body cultivators. Our boy remembers once kicking a guy named A Kin. Mr. Jun says our boy has another toy and that he's really just a kid. But our boy responds that it's not a toy, he just got that baby. It was literally an 8x scope that helped him see targets and could obviously be equipped on precision rifles and even sniper rifles. The guy says that today he would kill the so-called genius. He launches an attack, telling him to turn to ashes. However, Zuji stands still and punches the fireball. The other guy is shocked. How is it possible to handle power like that? Zuji says Jun talked about something he didn't understand about enough force creating pressure in a vacuum. He didn't understand any of it except the part that he would be invincible. The guy says something like that is impossible, but says it's fine. He warns him to try defending against this then. Zuji gets ready and unleashes a barrage of punches into the air. Man, the guy's power was destroyed before it could even be thrown. Zuji says he beat him when he had power and was hurting people. And today, even without any power, he'll get beaten again. Our boy even feels sorry for the enemies, saying it was a painful and cruel fight. He already knows that Zuji will win this and judging by Kanchen's performance in the earlier rounds, He's sure she's already an apprentice and a martial artist because she didn't even move from her spot. How is it that he, the sect leader, is weaker than his own disciples? The greater this difference became, the more pressure he felt. However, the opponents would become stronger as the rounds progressed. They have to keep giving their best and make him feel increasingly pressured. Five disciples had entered the fifth round and he advanced another 10%. People were impressed that in five rounds, no steel bone sect disciple had been eliminated from the competition. How could a trash rank 9 sect have so many strong people? However, someone was smiling saying that Jun could enjoy his current triumph. No matter how far that loser had come, he wouldn't defeat the genius of the Xiao family. With that, the match between Linny and Zuji was announced. The guy was confident. 
Linny had been training in the Soundless Valley for months on end. However, in the audience, people seemed to be betting more on Zuji due to his performances that day. Linny was furious and said that today he would prove who was the strongest in their family. However, Zuji simply said that Linny had no chance of winning. Linny responded that he was already at the opening stage and was a martial artist, while the boy had no power. So how did he plan to win that fight? The old man seemed to realize Linny was losing control, but he would become stronger and calm once he destroyed Zuji. Linny activates the Thousand Palms explosion and says this is the end of Zuji. However, the ground beneath him starts to crumble, and he says he already told him. The attack hits directly, and he warns that Linny won't win this. At most, the attacks were destroying his clothes. People were shocked. It's not common for someone to take an attack like that and not even budge. Linny said he knew Zuji had gotten stronger, but he didn't expect him to withstand a 1,250 kilo hit. But it didn't matter. If one attack didn't work, he just needed to land two, three, or as many as necessary. Linny moves to the side, and Zuji just observes. The guy seems confident since Zuji hasn't moved. He goes for the back and says if that's the case, Zuji would die right then. Man, he lands a hammer strike on the back of the neck. The guy says he didn't expect him to try dodging like that. He throws another palm and says it looks like Zuji still has the courage to fight. He was confident and Zuji noticed something. The guy landed another palm on his chest and said Zuji was a great punching bag. But while taking hits, Zuji said that the right hand was 150 kilos stronger than the other. But as far as he remembered, Linny usually fought with his left. The guy asked what he was talking about and launched a double attack, exploding him completely. Zuji says that Linny has been cultivating so much that he forgot to practice the physical aspect. With that, he throws Linny away. He falls to the ground, wondering how that was possible. But in the same second, Zuji is already beside him. And this time, he strikes him in the arm. The poor guy is sent flying. However, he quickly returns and starts attacking Zuji again. The old man couldn't understand how Zuji could match Linny's speed without using any aura power. And with that, Zuji lands another punch on the poor guy's ribs. Man, he was sent flying across the sand like a fool. He gets up, trembling, and says that Zuji is a loser. He had lost all this cultivation, his life was already ruined, and he had been expelled from the family. So how could he not defeat him? And why was he still the invincible genius? He slams the ground, admitting he lost. Zuji asks the elder if that's the boy he's been training so much. Immediately, the old man stands up and asks if he's looking for death. Man, but he almost got a bullet to the head. Jem blows on the barrel and asks if anyone gave him permission to stand up. He warns that he better sit down or the next one would be to his head. With that, the fights continue. It was Kin Yang against a guy in yellow clothes, who took an elbow strike and was already finished. That was already the fight of the eight finalists and Kin Yang advanced with ease. Liu asks Jun how the boy who was at the 10th opening was already so strong in just two months. He wanted to know how Jun trained them and why he was sweating so much. Our boy was thinking that Kin Yang already had more cultivation than him. Apparently, he was now the third strongest in the sect. He says the system needs to give him better hacks. How is he being humiliated by his own disciples like this? The system says he will get what he wants once he completes this mission. Chaoma wins his match and Chanchen wins hers. Now was the first fight between Seal Bone sect members. Tan Ki versus Zuji. Everyone was excited for that fight. They stared at each other for a second, disappeared out of nowhere, and everyone was shocked by their speed. Man, the boys looked like brothers fighting. Both prepared a similar attack. It was rock, paper, scissors. Zuji won and Tian Ki asked why he didn't use paper like he said he would. Zuji says he predicted the prediction Qian Kai had predicted, and that's why he won. Everyone was confused by the fight. They start complaining, asking if they're clowns for sitting there watching rock, paper, scissors. Meanwhile, Jun says he had noticed they were faking it for a long time. Apparently, they would have to get beaten up to learn how to lie. From that round, four disciples advanced. He completes another 10% of the mission and gains 20 more contribution points. He's all excited considering everything and already has over 300 points. The system informs him that the task was being completed with a lot of extra value, so he would receive additional rewards. He starts gaining a ton of experience, and suddenly, he begins to exude an aura in the middle of the arena. The boy receives so much power that he was left breathless. He tells the system he can't believe so much power was given to him. The system congratulates him, saying he is now a level 5 martial artist. Leo asks if he likes his disciples so much that he gets stronger when he sees them win. With that, the guy in the middle of the arena wants to know, were the four really going to play rock, paper, scissors to decide who would be the winner? Xiaomo says that would be too boring. They had a much better decision. Everyone prepares to attack. Each one is judged from a corner. Kanshin is the first to leave, and she says that because of that, she's in fourth place. King Yang says he was third, so he takes third place. Xiaomo says it's the same for him, so the champion has already been decided. Zuji was the only one who didn't know what was happening, but he gets emotional and thanks them. The audience, on the other hand, is side-eyeing these lunatics who are mocking them. Meanwhile, our boy congratulates everyone and says Dudu will prepare a celebratory dinner. On the way back, he was all excited. The sextant earned 10 stones, each worth 10,000 silver coins. 
However, the boys just wanted to take off those ridiculous clothes. But our boys said the little boys looked lovely like that. So he told the three martial artists to show up and be part of the celebration. King Yang was confused by this. But our boy told those who were following them to show themselves already. He just wanted to know if they were from the Rising Water sect or the Xiao family. And before anything, he wanted to thank them because they would serve as a test for his new power. Man, in a second, he was already cutting down three of them. The guys haven't even reacted and they were already all down. Jem approached and stepped on one's chest, noticing there was water in his pocket. Xiaomo then called out and told him to pay attention. It seemed they were all already dead. Our boy asked if these guys were kamikazes without realizing there were two more in front of him. The guys took advantage of the distraction to try and finish him off. However, Jun wasn't a fool and knew no one goes on an assassination mission with an identification tag. But whoever their boss was learned a lesson today. Jun realized that now that he's a level 5 apprentice, these level 2 guys are too weak for him. Clearly, the system always wants him to defeat the strong. And these two sects that are hunting him won't get away with it. A thunderbolt strikes a tree. The boy is there sizzling, the rope laughing like a psychopath. I think this boy is crazy because he asks who's cutting down trees during a storm. Ah, that explains it. This guy had died and someone reincarnated in his body. Apparently, he had been sealed for millions of years, and now he was back to regain his cultivation. Suddenly, he feels a headache and begins to recover his memories. It seems a certain woman ascended to the heavens and became the foundation of mortal faith, and he was known as Lord Yi, one of the top ten martial artists. Suddenly, the rain stops, and he starts wondering if even the heavens respect him. He announces to the heavens that he, Yi Extinction, will destroy the Great Empress. But at that moment, something is approaching. While he shouts that he will use the Great Mystery Sutra technique to dominate this world, in the middle of his words, he gets hit in the face with a ball. Someone says that the soccer ball hit someone in the face. The guys approach to saying that the boy is very unlucky to have interrupted their game like that. Obviously, it's Jim's buddies who ask if they can leave the kid there and pretend nothing happened. Our boy says they can't just abandon him. They need to take him to the sect and heal him. He is Yeek Sinction. He was a martial artist who dominated the entire continent, but someone hit him with a secret weapon. He doesn't know where he is but it seems someone helped him. However, he needs to escape quickly to find a place with a lot of spiritual energy and start cultivating. But suddenly, he takes another ball to the face. He is Yi Xingqin, who used to be a martial god. At that moment, he stops and realizes he's said that before, hasn't he? He needs to find a place with a lot of spiritual energy and realizes he's said that too. Then Jun opens the door in his face and asks if he's awake. The poor guy says it happened again. Our boy apologizes and says he didn't realize he was right behind him. He is Yi Extinction and now wants to kill this guy. Our boy introduces himself and tells him to be careful when entering their soccer field. He had been unconscious for several days in a row. He then introduces himself as Jun, the leader of the Steel Bone Sect. Sin Shen says the sect's name is Trash and Jun seems like Trash too. Our boy says it seems like he knows a lot about the world and asks who he is. The boy just tells Jun that he's someone he shouldn't mess with. He gets closer and says it's better not to mess with him or else. He gets hit in the face with another ball and someone apologizes. Seeing him take another hit, Jun says the team needs a goalkeeper like that. However, he noticed that this guy's conversation seemed too mature for such a young boy. Could you be another genius? He is Yi Xingqin. Our boy shouts for him to stop repeating that nonsense. He asks if he's ready to join the sect and says it has many benefits. The boy says this place is trash and there's no way he's joining. However, Jun asks if he's some kind of martial god to be refusing. He warns that he has three seconds or he'll be forced. Sin Shen questions if he's being threatened. He warns that no one will do that. But actually, he thought it over and decided to join this sect, which seems pretty good. And the name is cool. Jun asks if he's really willing to join of his own free will. He's sitting in the chair about to take a ball, saying he'd do anything for the Seal Bone sect. The crowd is devastated that he gave in so easily, and he asks to leave. However, he swears that when he recovers the mastery of the Sutra, he'll come back here and kill Jun. Our boy stamps the papers and says he's now the 102nd disciple. He hands over the initial cultivation technique and tells him not to show it to anyone. That night, the boy threw the technique on the ground. To him, the teachings of a rank 9 sect were trash. However, curiosity made him want to take a peek so he wouldn't be left wondering. He started reading and was shocked. Why did that sect have a god-level body-strengthening technique? But once again, he takes a ball to the face and someone tells him to shut up because there's training tomorrow. The next chapter asks what defines an assassin. Someone who can kill the target in 10 moves without leaving a trace. Or someone who only lets their hostility be noticed just before killing the target. That's what a professional assassin does, and death was now coming for him. However, the knife hits the book. The bald guy wonders what kind of bamboo scripture is as resistant as that. It was actually a manuscript on how to be a good sect leader. At that moment, the guy starts running, saying an assassin who fails the first strike must escape. Jun smiles. Apparently, this guy was skilled since Jun only noticed when he was so close. But it was a pity. You couldn't escape the steel bone sect that easily. And the poor guy runs into a barrier. He wonders why that was put there, and falls to the ground like a fool. 
Jun says they can't try the same trick twice. The sect had a junior formation protection that cost 50 points to make and 1 point to maintain. Our boy says that the guy's hairstyle is quite special, and asks if, by any chance, he's Hitman, the Assassin 47. The guy says he never imagined his codename would be revealed. Apparently, Jun had information from the Mist Tower. Jun is confused about this Mist Tower business. He reveals it's the first time he's heard that name. The guy questions how Jun knew his alias and Jun says he just guessed. The guy says that apparently the leader is a genius who managed to extract information from him, a level 4 artist. However, Jun is more curious about why someone hired such a professional, and says that someone this good must cost at least 5,000 coins. The guy responds that it would be far too little, it's at least 10,000. That's when our boy's expression changes. Jun grabs him by the collar and says that someone as talkative as him isn't fit for this job and will learn his lesson in the dungeon. The guy wonders if this was all a trap for a professional like him. The scene shifts to the Rising Water sect. A guy is doing bicep curls, asking why it's so hard to kill that guy. The old man tells him to stop underestimating Jun, especially since he's already killed two of them. But this time, it was a professional from the Mist Tower. There was nothing to worry about. This guy is Wai Yixi, the leader of the Rising Water sect. The guy with the afro is angry about having to keep sending assassins for revenge. However, the leader tells him to calm down because once Jun is dead, they'll get their revenge. They'll go to that sect, kill each disciple, and paint the floor red. Then the leader was interrupted and asked what brought Mr. Kin there. This guy is Kin Horan, the leader of the Hundred Sex Alliance. He apologizes for not having eliminated Jun yet and says they can't let someone like that roam free. He wouldn't stop until that guy was crippled or dead. But at that moment, someone from the side says that it seems he's the great leader. It's Jun from atop the wall, saying he's witnessing a memorable moment. The guy says he had already sensed him and asks what was so memorable there. Jun says the destruction of the Rising Water sect would be memorable. The guy with the Afra yells that he will kill Jun, but the old man tells him to calm down. He warns that if Jun is there, it means the assassin is dead. Jun then says he's going to be generous. The plaque of their sect will be used as the coffin lid. And he warns Mr. Kin not to get involved or the Hundred Sex Alliance will also be dissolved. But the guy says that Jun is truly bold to think of destroying that place in front of him. Our boy just throws the plaque and tells him to make the right choice. It flies toward the two guys from the Rising Water sect, who are in shock. But Kin catches it in the air. He says Jun is at level 5 of a martial apprentice, but has the strength of someone at level 7. He doesn't know where Jun gets this extra strength from, but has to remember he is level 9. And what he's going to do now is demand an apology from everyone. At that moment, a bullet is already heading for his face. The guy dodges it just in time, and his hair gets cut. Kin asks if that's why Jun feels so confident, but warns him that his trick is now exposed. But then he hears a scream behind him. The guy with the afro had already gone to the other life. And our boy says that apparently someone at level 9 can barely dodge a bullet. Kin questions why Jun wants to destroy the Rising Water sect and asks why he has so much malice. Jun simply explains that the Rising Water sect teamed up with the bandits. They tried to kill him countless times and even hired an assassin from the Mist Tower. If that's the case, after he kills everyone there, they can ask for forgiveness. The old man warns that he'll send disciples from the Sacred Tower to finish off everyone in the Steel Bone sect. He may die, but he'll be waiting for Jun and all of his disciples in hell. However, our boy just says that the basic rule of the Steel Bone sect is to kill those who offend them. And the old man would be waiting a long time in hell. Hyun starts to activate power in his arm and tells him not to do that. But Jun just jumps with the tip of his blade. Kin tries to block with his hand, and our boy says the guy is an idiot for doing that against the system sword. Jun cuts his hand and stabs him in the back. Kin can't believe his martial art didn't stop the blade. And our boy sends his head flying. He announces that the Rising Water sect and the Steel Bone sect are now out of the Hundred Sex Alliance. Idiots like them didn't deserve to be allies of the Steel Bone sect. The scene changes to Shin talking to Lord C of the city, saying he couldn't forgive a villain like that. But C says he would punish the boy if he were wrong. However, he had only killed the bad people from that sect and let the disciples disperse. The guy complains that the sect had been destroyed. But Xi shouts, saying those bastards had allied with bandits. Besides, they had the audacity to call an assassin from the Mist Tower. He knows Mr. Kin liked the Rising Water sect, but he couldn't forget who really ran the city of King Yang. If something like this happened again, don't blame him for what he would do. The scene shifts to the sect where a monkey is dancing. There's music playing, telling everyone to dance and throw their bodies on the floor. For some reason, all the disciples are literally dancing. Our boy realizes that yet another embarrassing item has arrived from the system. That modified speaker made everyone in a 100 meter radius start dancing. As silly as it was, our boy thought it would be good to use at the right moment. It would be hilarious if the enemy in the middle of a fight started dancing out of nowhere. He slaps himself and Xingqin is sure he's looking at a madman. What he wants to know is how he, a martial god, is being dominated by some sort of dance technique. Sometime later, the morning exercise was over, and the poor guy was desperate to get away from that place. He just wanted to escape because he had no dignity left. But someone approached him, called Xingqin and said they wanted to talk to him. 
The poor guy already knew what was coming. Walking through the sect, Jun said that from his eyes, he knew Xingqian had lived a long life. He invited free men like him, because living like a wonderful person was all his life was about. He was sure Xingqian was thinking about escaping this place, and that he probably couldn't quite understand the Steel Bone sect. There were the bodybuilding machines that strengthened him, and the morning dances, as silly as they were, really helped him recover. And although this place would make him lose cultivation resources beyond imagination, it would surely be hard for him to take his revenge. At that moment, our boy knew he had hit the nail on the head. Jun says he doesn't know Xingqian's story, but if he cultivated at the Steel Bone sect, there would be no limit on his path to becoming stronger. The boy asks if Jun would really help him become a martial god again. Our boy says that being a martial god is just the beginning. He would help him reach a level above that. Xingqian says that the scripture and the training room prove Jun isn't lying. So for now, he would be a disciple. However, he could tell that the leader's roots were extremely weak and that he wouldn't make any progress. Our boy says he's incredible and seems to have special eyes, but he had no idea of the types of cultivation secrets he possessed. Some time later, someone finally fixed the sex door. Xing Chen was eager to explore this world. However, Jun did some keepy uppies with a soccer ball. While the guy was running, yearning for freedom, Jun kicked the ball, hitting the door and bouncing back in his face. Xing Chen already knew this was the end of his adventure. Jun asks where the Picasso of doors thinks he's going. Tells him to fix it properly or he'd be stuck as a goalkeeper forever. He then goes to the city where many stalls are set up. He went to this specific place for pills and bought a bunch to help the disciples. But that wasn't enough, he still wanted to look around there. The pharmacy of the Rai family, the one where he had beaten up both the son and the father. The guy greets him and asks how he can help. Chun says he's there for big business but will only talk to the manager. The chubby guy asks for his name. He says he's Jun Changxiao and the Steel Bone sect. The guy is startled knowing that he's the one who beat the elder. He turns to the man next to him and tells him to call everyone. Chun questions if he really thinks they'll beat him that easily. But he realizes they're actually just calling everyone to make tea for him. Then the father appears, saying it's been a while since Jun last visited. Jun says he didn't expect him to show up because of the conflicts. However, the guy isn't crazy enough to try anything. He already knows what happened at the Rising Water sect. He says that the problem they had with each other only helped them get to know each other better. So he asks what Jun is there to offer. He hands over a list with the names of some herbs. Says he doesn't care how many they have, he'll take everything. The guy says it would cost a fortune. Just the diva flower alone is extremely expensive, and they have over 200. Jun knows that this one is perfect since it enhances energy circulation. Apparently, the high family was truly wealthy. The guy says it would cost at least 100,000 coins, even with a discount. And Jun responds that he's beaten up several bandits until he has plenty of money. Shang Shi Yen says he will deliver everything tomorrow and asks if Jun knows a thing or two about alchemy. Our boy says he only knows the basics and has some pills he made recently. This one, for example, is a healing pill. And if he wants, he can buy one of these. Shang Shi says that pill is so basic that there's no profit in making it to sell. However, suddenly, he's startled. Jun out of nowhere punches the servant. Man, the guy coughed up blood, but our boy tosses something. Shang Shi asks why he killed the shopkeeper. But at that moment, the guy says he's fine. The leaguer is shocked. The guy's exterior had been destroyed. He goes and touches his chest. The back had been broken in half, so how was it already healed? The guy says these pills aren't healing pills, they're magic. Immediately, the leader asks how many of those he has and says he'll buy them all. Jun says he'll give a discount, so it will only cost 10,000. The old man says 10,000 per pill is too cheap and orders about 100,000. Actually, Jun was going to sell a pot with several pills for 10,000, not each one. Apparently, being rich was pretty nice. The leader then hands over a spatial ring with various items, saying it's like a gift for the beginning of their cooperation. Our boy tosses 10 pills and says that also covers the costs. And Shang Shi says it will be a pleasure to do business with him always. At that moment, Jun receives a bunch of achievements for spending a lot of money. One of the rewards is two fluids that improve aptitude. Immediately, he rushes off desperately, saying he has things to do. The shopkeeper congratulates the boss, saying those pills could easily be sold for 30,000 each. But he responds that he's thinking too small. With good negotiation, offers would start at 50,000. Indeed, Mr. Jun was a money tree. Our boy had already consumed the fluid and wondered if that stuff caused a cold. But he starts walking through the forest, and the spiritual energy begins to affect everything around him. He wonders if this is how someone with superior roots feels. Since this energy was eager, he would absorb everything. With that, he immediately advances to level 6 and then to level 7. Now he understood how King Ming felt and why he progressed faster than everyone else. This made him eager to discover the next levels even more. And considering that Kanchen was stronger than King Yang, he wondered what her roots were. The scene returns to the sect. He's having to spam the system. There wasn't an option to click to produce 99 at once. So there had to be one at a time until his finger started hurting. Two hours later, he had produced a ton of pills. His finger might be suffering from spasms, but the disciples would make a lot of progress. 
It was already afternoon outside, so he decided to take a look at the shop to see if there was anything useful before going to bed. Immediately, he saw something he couldn't resist. The system asked if he was sure because it would cost more than 100 contribution points. He said yes because something like this only appeared once every thousand years. A flash of light appeared and the system congratulated him. He had received a modified QBU-88 sniper rifle. He was thrilled, saying that a real man needed to have one of these. This scoundrel was now better armed than modern warriors. He immediately equipped that scope he had found. A good sniper rifle with an 8x scope. The system said that this combination could activate the upgrade system. He told it to activate but it cost him 5 points and he felt a bit down. However, he immediately sensed something. He was like, wow, hacking his way to seeing the entire sect. The rascal knew this was a game hack and said he was really cheating now. Suddenly, he heard someone say they had breached the magical barrier of that place. He immediately aimed the sniper. He saw two individuals approaching. He overheard them talking about how number 47 wouldn't be so easy to kill June. Our boy was startled. This sniper could see through walls and even had enhanced hearing. It seemed his money was well spent and he would have to show how things were done in the sect. These guys were crazy for coming to this place after knowing what happened to 47. But here was their welcome gift. As soon as the bullet hit the wall, the guys sensed something was wrong, realizing they had been exposed. But too late, my friend. Our boy says that in the battle between the sniper and the assassins, it's now 1-0. to zero. It seems the Mist Tower is going to have to disappear. He is congratulated for the double kill and even received his sect technique. He's excited since it's something everyone can practice too. It allows a person to send a crescent-shaped slash. It's great for saving energy and for long-range combat. Our boy is already excited, knowing that tomorrow he has the perfect person to learn this. The guy asks if Jun is sure because he's dangerous with a blade. He warns that he was born for this and tells Jun to come at him. But suddenly, he's surrounded by a bunch of light, and the poor guy was blown up. Jun is impressed. That wasn't just energy saving, it barely used any energy at all. Amid the smoke, the guy then says he'd like to become a disciple of that place. Our boy asks why. Wasn't he trying to escape yesterday? The guy replies that after seeing such incredible swordsmanship, he's willing to learn everything there. Besides, he ate Dudu's food yesterday and realized he wanted to stay there for the rest of his life. Jun says that if that's the case, he'll be washing dishes for her. He says not to worry, he was born to wash dishes. Jun is already getting irritated with this guy who keeps saying he was born for everything, and says fine then. He's just the kind of talent that the sect needs. The scene shifts to three days later in the city of Huyang, and Jun asks if you already want to stay in this world. Are you not ready to face death? Just one of Ray's pills was enough to cure any illness or wound and keep you healthy. The whole city was interested in it. Everyone gathers to witness the sale of these items. People are commenting that they're doing something so grand that it's putting their entire reputation at risk. In the midst of this, the gray-haired man recognizes a boy as the second son of the Song family. It's a shame because he was a prodigy who was attacked by a beast in the forest and ended up paralyzed. Now he's in this situation where he's neither alive nor dead, and this after being on the path to becoming one of the best in three years. Suddenly, he receives the healing pill. The bald man asks what they were feeding the second son of the Song family. It was embarrassing to make them come all the way there just to deliver such nonsense. However, the boy starts trying to lift his arm. Everyone watches in silence. The arm falls back onto the chair. It's unclear if the bald man is impressed or dismayed that the boy managed to move his hand with just a pill. Suddenly, the kid starts emitting an aura. Man, he opens his eyes. He opens his hands. He stands up smiling. He destroys the wheelchair and says he can finally move. All of his meridians had been reconnected and his cultivation was restored. The bald man asks how this is possible. Everyone realizes it's a miracle. It wasn't just medicine, it was an extra life. Shang-Chi says that this is the effect of the secret pill that can even reopen the meridians of a martial artist. Instantly, people start offering 20, 30, 50,000. Some hooded folks with a Cardano offer 75,000. King Han then asks Jun if he hadn't said he sold each of those for 10,000 because it was a great profit. However, it seems the price of the pills surpassed 100,000. Our boy cries, lamenting the lost money. He returns home devastated. Every step he takes hurts. He can't believe the last one even sold for 120,000. But someone tells Master Jun not to leave like that. It's Shang-Chi, who says he noticed him at the stadium. Our boy says he came to request his sect to be considered a level 8 sect and saw that the auction was a success. Shang-Chi says it's all thanks to him and the medicine he sold. He offers 200,000 coins as a thank you. Now our boy is all smiles. Shang-Chi says they need to maintain long-term cooperation. Jun then takes out 10 more pills and says the price for those will be. At that moment, Shang-Chi interrupts and says it will be 1 million because as soon as everyone finds out about its effect, the price will rise. Our boy realizes he's just a village boy. He almost said 500,000. Shen Yang asks if he's saying he sold them for 10,000 because he knew he would get all this afterward. Our boy says yes, he planned everything from the beginning and knew this would be the final profit. However, Qin Yang only asks if this is how he deals with the pains of the past. 
At that moment, Xiaomu interrupts the two and says they've arrived. The certification hall. Inside, a man blows on his tea. They ask why they can't be considered a rank 8 sect. The man slams his cup down and says it's because they don't meet all the requirements. Jun comments that as far as he knows, you just need to have five people in the sect who are at martial apprentice rank or higher. The man says he's heard about their fight, but there's no way to register without justification. Jun then asks how to get this. The man says they first have to go to the village committee. Xiaomu gets excited, saying it will be easy, but Chun says he's too naive. The man then starts talking a lot. The boy begins to feel crushed by all the bureaucracy. He asks if there isn't an easier way. The man says there's no way to help. This is how the procedure works. However, someone from behind says that the steel bone is becoming famous, so they can make a small special alteration. It's the elder from before and the boy gets excited. He tells Jun he didn't expect to find him there and asks the man to ease up on the analysis. But the other guy responds that there's no need to go easy since he's just doing his job. However, at that moment, the man stamps the seal. The process was approved and they just need to take a photo afterward. The two are confused by this. They fix his hair saying it needs to be perfect and pushes Bang's back so his ears can be seen. With that, this ridiculous photo of him is taken. Our boy thanks them profusely for all the help and says he needs to return to his sect. At least the sect's evolution to level 8 earned him 100 contribution points and 100 achievement points. However, he wonders if the system knows how much he suffered for these points. Back at the boy's sect, Zuji is practicing as usual. Jun shows up and says he has a present. He tosses it into his hand and tells him to make the most of it. Immediately, he sees it's a bunch of spiritual cores and says that they are worth a lot of money. Our boy says yes, he spent 170,000, but that's the next step he chose for him. His strength was already at 4,600 kilos, but his body was reaching its limit. However, a warrior could learn to use weapons and equipment. Oh my god, he's going to give the guy a sniper rifle. He tells him to take this weapon and come along to the mountain. Once there, he says to always remember, he needs to know the bullet's speed, the wind and everything that can affect his aim. After disabling the safety mechanism and being sure, he can take the shot. The boy says yes, and man, the shot destroys the ground. Jun says he almost forgot to mention, this magical weapon had a bit of recoil. He walks away, saying it seems the guy couldn't handle the pressure. This just shows that his physical strength still had a lot to improve. However, he noticed the boy had talent since he hit the target even after being pushed so far back. Zuiji, excited, says he'll do his best at this sniper thing. The next day, the guys were training. They hit him right in the chest. He was trembling but told them to go again. Jun was impressed that this boy pushed himself so hard. Khan explains that he always wanted to prove he's strong through his skills. Even though he beat his brother, there's still the woman to beat. Our boy asks if he's talking about his ex-wife and if she's strong. Khan explains that her name was Mu Hongsen, and she was a descendant of the Mirong family, one of the largest in the Tianhai country. Not only did she have excellent roots, but she was also accepted as a disciple of a second-level sect. Our boy gets excited. This revenge story would be incredible. However, as a master, he was worried that this boy was pushing himself too far. He shouts and breaks the wood when he hits him. Jun is eager to see Morong Sin learn what regret is. A few days later, our boy hands over some other stones, saying that with these, the recoil would be much lower. He had to remember that the wind was going from the north to the east at a speed of 3 degrees. Zuji says everything is being calculated and the target is found. He counts down from 3 to 1, and when he's about to shoot, he sees something approaching. Someone arrives in front of the sect. The girl says that this is the so-called Steel Blood sect, and it doesn't look as ruined as they say. Then something catches her attention. Someone approaches, and she asks if it's him. Zuji appears and asks what she's doing there. Five years ago, when she came to break the engagement, the moment he lost his cultivation, he became a disgrace to the family, and no one wanted to be by his side anymore. When he was a genius, everyone wanted to be close, but now, not even his family wants him. The engagement had been arranged, so he had no feelings for her. However, she humiliated him and his relatives, laughing in their faces. He then tells her to just say what she wants, or he'll point the gun. The girl just said she's from the first lineage of the Morong family, and when she comes to King Yang City, she should be received by the elders. So where are those who pay respect to this place? He's already walking away, closing the door when she yells at him. He says if she wants to enter, she can. Otherwise, he'll close it. She walks in shouting that it really is in men's level sect, but is startled to see the size of the buildings. It's actually a little bigger than she imagined. He tells her she has to know they're evolving, already an 8th level sect and expanding even more. She sees people training and says that, however, they have low cultivation and mediocre qualifications. But Zuji says everyone there has only been practicing for a few months. Then she starts trembling because she saw several people who had already opened 10 meridians. She looks and says that he, however, is still the same and hasn't evolved. She says that in the past, she didn't understand about spiritual roots and his family situation. She didn't ask to separate because she thought he was weak, but because she didn't want to marry someone she didn't know. Zuiji responds that that was a long time ago. He's already found his own path. Someone is just drinking some tea there. Our boy says that this woman isn't so bad. She just seems very straightforward. 
Meanwhile, Yang wonders if it's right for the boss to be spying like this. Muralm then hands over a vial with 10 meridian opening pills to make up for what she did. At first he asks if she pities him and says he won't accept this compensation. But suddenly, he gets a whack on the head with Jun asking who said he could refuse. With something dripping down his head, he's sure that whatever dignity he had left is now gone. Suddenly, a small plaque appears telling him to add a time limit. He says 10 years, but another plaque appears saying that's too much, so he says 8. He turns to Jun and tells him to stop sending these things in his face. He snatches the pills from her hand and says that in 3 years, he, Shiozuji, will challenge the people of the Lily sect. Muron feels a bit awkward and says that's fine. She'll be waiting for him at the sect. The boy was motivated and then asks Jun why he forced this if he had asked him not to have any relationship with her. Jun says he doesn't want him to defeat the Lily sect, but rather to defeat his own problems. Only by ending the person he was in the past will he regain confidence and self-esteem. Zuji asks what kind of crazy talk is this and immediately wants to grab this sniper rifle, saying he's going to put an end to this guy. Sometime later, our boy is asking the system if it could analyze the ingredients of those pills and create some recipes. This way, his chance of strengthening the disciples would increase again. And most importantly, it was to solve the problem of Zuji's spiritual roots. 50 contribution points are spent, and he learns about the Qi transformation liquid. Staring at the vial, Zuji asks if this will really restore his roots. He says he doesn't know if it will improve the old quality, but it's better than nothing. Zuji immediately drinks it and says it smells a bit like malt. Jun tells him to wait for the activation now. Suddenly, the boy starts screaming with veins showing on his face. A black smoke begins to emerge, and our boy is confused. He asks the system what this is because he's never heard of anything like it. The system explains that the boy had consumed a poison and that it was cleansing his body. As the poison is expelled, some veins seem to appear on his arm. The problem is figuring out who did this, maybe the family leader or someone even more unknown. The smoke is fading, so the detoxification is nearing its end. Suji takes a deep breath and says he's strangely able to feel spiritual energy again. He kneels down and tells Jun that the second life he received belongs to him. Our boy grabs him by the elbow and says there's no me for that. All he has to do is help the Steel Bones sect get stronger and stronger. He doesn't need to kneel. He should always stand tall, stop crying, and get back to cultivating. The boy just thanks him. A little later, Jun says he can't understand. Zuji only recovered a small portion of his power, which is odd. The poison shouldn't have been able to consume both his cultivation and his root base. The only possibility is that he was inflicted with two or more poisons. Jun says the system could sell a little bit of intelligence because his head can't handle this. He asks if the system could do that, and it says this is the first time it has heard of something like this. But unfortunately, there was no medicine to heal brain damage. Meanwhile, on the rooftop, Sinkin wonders about this Lily sect. When he used to be in charge, it was just a simple level 5 place. But now he's stuck here at the Steel Bone sect, unable to leave because the scriptures are too good. He decides it's time to return to cultivating his speed. He then lands in front of the house. He turns to Jun and says that tomorrow he's heading to the beast-infested area for some training. Our boy responds that he's been evolving a lot and besides, he needs to consolidate his human body. However, he's very curious because he overheard the entire conversation with Zuji. And since he knows the boy has regained his power, tomorrow they will go together to hunt and evolve. The pair was peculiar, with an extremely powerful reincarnated cultivator and a genius everyone thought was a waste. Whether they liked it or not, they made an interesting duo. Our boy decides it's time to go back to the city, buy more herbs, and check how preparations for the auction are going. In the city, everyone is talking about the medicine of the gods that the Rai family is selling. The poor folks are complaining they won't have a chance at something like that, and apparently, even the wine for the rich was huge. Our boy is all happy. It looks like money is going to rain down again. However, he can't help but think they're making a fool out of him since they're making much more money. They need to build a pharmacy at the sect too, but who would manage something like that? Inside the shop, a chubby man is shouting, saying the old man is very cunning. Mr. May is beating him with a broom, and Jun asks what's happening. May explains that because of the auction, they need more people to work, but this old man won't leave them alone. The man starts shouting that he's a rank 3 medicine apprentice, and what he's asking for isn't excessive. May continues to beat him, and Jun tells him to wait a bit and listen to what the man is asking for. The old man says that what he's asking for is based on his strength, and it's only 5,000 coins a month. Jun says they can beat him, but not that hard because it's not that unreasonable. The old man then says he doesn't work overtime, works when he wants, and leaves whenever he wants. Plus, they have to pay in advance and, of course, have some very friendly helpers. Instantly, the two grab the broom, and Jun says he'll help teach this guy a lesson. But first, he tells the old man that if that's what he wants, he's either an idiot or should accept being an herbalist. The old man shakes his head and says it's a shame to have met more idiots. Without him, that pile of herbs would just go to waste. Mr. Met asks what he's talking about since the herbs they have are of the highest quality. The old man says that herbs are good, but the waste comes from those who hammer them. Mr. May immediately wants to beat him up, but Jun tells him to hold on for a moment. 
That's because the system informed him that the old man's words were true. The old man approached, and Mr. May said that the leaf cloth was of the highest quality. However, the old man explained that this plant could absorb the spiritual energy around it, and if someone touches them directly with their hands, they lose a lot of energy, reducing their medicinal power. Every time he sees something of such quality being destroyed, his heart breaks. Thankfully, he knows how to recover its effects. The system immediately says that a strange energy has been detected and that the effect of the leaf had increased by 300%. However, Mr. May said all of this was nonsense, something only an idiot would believe. Until Jun said that they not only accepted all the old man's terms, but would pay him 10,000 per month. The old man asked why they wanted to pay so much, but he wouldn't complain. If that was the case, he'd go fetch his things and head to the Steel Bone sect right away. The system congratulates him for completing his secret mission and even gives him 50 points. Seeing that recruiting Elder Wei gave points, he knows he found a treasure. With that, Elder Wei was heading home and some kids greeted him happily, calling him Grandpa. Jun congratulated him on having so many healthy grandchildren. He says those were orphans he had adopted. He knows may call him ridiculous for doing this in a place where only strength matters. However, some things need to be done. Jun says now it makes sense why he leaves work whenever he wants. Bringing him on board was definitely the right decision. He also says that if he wants, he can bring the kids to the sect because they are building a big place with space for them to play. The old man asks why and our boy says it's because he's loaded with money and wants to flaunt it. The old man says he was worried about the kids and would appreciate it, but he knows that orphans who go to his sect often die on the battlefield. He'd like these kids to decide their own futures. Jun tells him not to worry, he'll never force them to fight for the sect. However, he also makes a bet with Mr. Wee that the kids would want to fight for them. He says they can go right away because when they get there, he'll have some disciples come pick them up. On the way, Jun is carrying a pile of herbs and Elder Wei tells him to be careful. Our boy says that if he's so worried about the herbs, he should help a little. Wei replies that if he weren't so old, he could help the boy. He starts coughing and Jun says he's just pretending, especially since he was almost fighting everyone just a moment ago. The scene shifts to the back of the mountain and Shaomo complains that he joined the sect to get good at fighting, not to be farming. The poor guys didn't expect to be brought to weed. But Wei shouts that it's just 10 acres of land and everyone should start working immediately because the best season for the herbs is coming. The poor souls got to work right away. Sometime later, he says that now that the land is clean, he'll teach these boys how to plant. Shaelmo is eager for the old man to finally do something. He explains that the seed needs to combine the energy of heaven and earth, along with a pure heart. He starts walking with an aura, throws the seed on the ground, and the old man performs an invocation to plant. Jun realizes how complex the old man's process is and how much energy is being accumulated. King Yang then informs him that a letter arrived while he was at the market. Our boy sees it's from the Spiritual Spring sect and knows they won't leave him alone. Apparently, Jun was being summoned to fight against a guy from that sect named Mo Shanfeng. Our boy gets angry, thinking they're underestimating him, believing they can beat him that easily. However, King Yang says the boss isn't as talented as he is, which is why they look down on him. Our boy laughs and tells him to send a letter saying he can't fight a disciple. He tells King Yang that since he's so confident, he'll be the one fighting, and he'll even receive some secret techniques. He sees the techniques are called Explosive Punch and Insta-Kill. Our boy tells him not to worry about the names, tosses him some pills, and tells him to focus on practicing them for the next few days. Excited, he says he'll reach the fourth level of a martial disciple and meet the boss's expectations. Jun tells him that this duel carries the honor of their sect, so he has to win. Three days later, they arrive at the sect, but the place looks completely run down. Jun said he was afraid they seemed tough just by the place they lived. Right then, they encountered the ancestors and Jun told King Yang to try to survive. Those were the three sovereigns of martial arts and their sect was terrified. Our boy said that even though they were just a fifth level sect, the gap was huge. But even if he lost, he wouldn't leave there without style. With that, he summoned something, a throne from Game of Thrones appears, declaring that he's there to accept the challenge of the spiritual spring sect. It's that same guy from before who says Jun is very arrogant for acting like this in front of the elders, who are just observing without saying anything. One of them remarks that it's incredible that in front of three martial sovereigns, he isn't afraid at all. However, he wanted to know if Jun was the person who had destroyed the Rising Water sect. Jun assumes these guys have a strong aura but asks if he's trying to learn something he already knows the answer to. He says that enough talk and they should bring out this Mo Shanfeng already because his people are tired of waiting. Even leader Kai was there and was impressed by his courage. Of course, the Spring sect people weren't too thrilled about it. One of them says it's ridiculous for someone from an 8th level sect to have so much courage, but another says he likes people like that and tells Mo Shanfeng to show up because there's a good target. Suddenly, a giant hand grabs someone's shoulder, saying that this was all a waste of time. Besides the leader of that place, he didn't think anyone else stood a chance against him. But then someone steps into the arena. Lin Chong introduces himself as an apprentice martial arts master and says he's been looking forward to this. The guy asks if they really sent someone from the 4th rank and introduces himself as Mo Shanfeng, an 8th rank martial apprentice. In this world, each of the ranks has 8 sub-ranks, 
and the lower the number, the better. In an instant, Shanfeng dodges and rushes toward King Yang. He already feels that the boy's aura is much more powerful, and man, he takes a solid hit to the arm. With just one move, he realizes that this guy can exceed 17,000 in strength. Man, the poor guy was thrown far away. Jun is already shocked that his disciple was beaten without him even noticing. Shanfeng says that his bones are hard, but that's all. Nothing more. He then announces that he now wants to fight the leader. Kuning Xian, however, says she can fight that guy. Shanfeng asks if she's better than the guy before, but from the smoke, someone says that the steel bone disciple doesn't lose with just one punch. It's King Yang, returning to the fight, saying it's not over yet. Instantly, the sect members are all cheering, saying their brother is amazing. At this, Jun notices something and seems to signal someone. From afar, in another part of the forest, Zhu Yeji has his sniper aimed, because it seems Jun already anticipated that things wouldn't be easy. Meanwhile, Xiangshan thinks the boy is too innocent. Thanks to him and his stealth technique, they aren't being noticed. At that moment, Shanfeng tells King Yang to give up. He's just going to keep getting beaten and eventually lose. His defense might be good, but how many punches could he withstand? At that moment, he defends with his arm, asking if that's all and saying he's already getting used to it. King Yang says that if that's the case, he's going to endure it and activates the wind fist technique. Man, once again, the poor guy was thrown far away, but this time he landed on his feet. But in the same second, Shanfeng charges at him again. King Yang decides it's time to play too and activates the explosive fist technique that Jun had taught him. One punch meets another, the usual small explosion happens and both are thrown back. However, Mo Shanfeng felt the pressure. His entire outfit was torn apart, and not only that, his arm was destroyed. He wonders how a punch with 20,000 kilos of force could lose. This explosive fist technique wasn't that simple. King Yang just takes a breath and swings his arm to the side. Instantly, he sends a series of slashes. Shanfeng is confused and has to dodge, not knowing what it is. The people are shocked that the boy knew spiritual arts. Even the elders of the sect are now starting to pay attention. In theory, this type of martial art was supposed to be attained by someone at the master level. From afar, Yi Xingqin couldn't believe it. This kind of technique consumes a lot of energy, but not only was King Yang using it, he was setting a whole sequence of them. If his sect has this boy, it's at least three times stronger. Apparently, that place had more secrets than he imagined. Shanfeng jumps and King Yang moves closer, but he takes advantage of the jump to send two slashes into the air. Shanfeng says that if he can't dodge, he'll break through it and punches the technique. He survives and realizes he could withstand it. However, at the same moment, King Yang is already face to face with him. Shanfeng tells him to back off and tries to throw a punch, but the boy manages to dodge and sends one to the side. Man, he taps his cheek and activates the explosive fist. With that, the fool is thrown far away. The spring elder begins to worry that the boy seems unstable. He had hit the wall and was getting up, but part of his face was turning black. He jumps towards King Yang, activating the storm fist, not just one or two, but a whole barrage of them. The elder was anxious, thinking that Jun Changxia was about to see his disciple get killed. But our boy just told him to stay quiet or he would lose both hands. However, King Yang just lowered his hand and sent a slash man. He delivered a sequence of cuts to Shanfeng midair, who wonders how it's possible for someone at the fourth rank to be this strong. A sequence of attacks like that would only be possible if he had infinite spiritual energy. Jun is excited that the boy has evolved so much that he survived. If it had been a little while ago, he would have died for sure. Meanwhile, Qian Chen realizes she needs to get back to training more because that damn guy was surpassing her. Jun stands up and declares that Shanfeng has been defeated for everyone in the heavens to see. The guy from Spring Sex says that his disciple is truly a gift from the gods, but this disciple has given him a bold idea. He then appears in front of Jun and asks what he thinks about a duel between the two of them. Jun quickly asks the system about this guy's strength, and it replies that he's a martial sovereign with at least 200,000 kilos per punch, though it can't accurately measure it. Poor Jun has a punch strength of 2,500. Even multiplying by five with all the talismans, he wouldn't stand a chance. The guy in the back asks why Jun is retreating so much. It would be shameful for a leader to refuse an elder. However, Jun simply responds that this bastard is a dog of the spring sect and tells him not to speak to him. The elder asks what he just said and calls him a bastard. Suddenly, something passes in front of him, startling everyone. A bullet lands beside his foot. The leader turns around, wondering where the attack came from as he didn't sense anything. It seems they must have some kind of secret weapon. Jun claims this was the work of the Dragon Shadow Squad belonging to his sect, and that weapon wasn't ordinary. It was a cannon of the gods. The leader knows he can dodge the bullet, but the problem is the other people. Knowing that his entire sect was in danger made him feel like prey. He calls Jun by name and asks if he thinks he can threaten him, and if he really thought he would be scared of these tricks. Jun realizes he has no choice but to use one of his talismans, but then he remembers he has something that would be much more amusing. Just then, someone runs over and asks if having a martial sovereign challenge an apprentice isn't over the top. It's the old man from before Mei Yutang. The spring sect elder asks why he's interfering in matters that don't concern his sect. But out of nowhere, the two start dancing. 
The Spring Sect Elder asks what Jun did, and Jun says he has no idea what's going on. They both turn to Jun and ask what he did. Jun apologizes and says he'll turn it off, it was just a small mistake. Yu Tang then says he saw everything that happened and that Jun didn't need to go that far because of it. However, the Spring Sect Elder loses his patience and tells the 4th and 5th Elders to help kill everyone. He asks how they dare speak ill of the Spring Sect. First, they need to catch Jun before he activates that thing. However, Jun just touches his radio. The old men start dancing to what looks like a Taylor Swift song, and they seem to be shaking it off. Jun says he never imagined it would be this catchy tune and didn't expect his sect members to get caught up in the rhythm too. However, something catches his attention. Koyan Xian was dancing seductively, and he feels unwell. She warns him to close his eyes because if he takes another look, he'll lose them. Jun says he's already changing the music and runs away, but it seems to switch to a song about a kiss. Sheng Chuan asks what he thinks he's doing, but as he gets closer, she tells him he's a dead man. The song talks about bringing lips closer and that with a kiss, it would fall in love. Our boy apologizes but says he's a delicate guy. Just then, someone shouts to get out of the way. Kin Yang comes running and grabs him by the legs. A flashback of Naruto and Sasuke. In that moment, Jun activates his power and tells him to stop with that stuff, wondering if this is really going to be his first kiss in two lives. He tells Chang Xian to stop laughing or she'll get beaten too. Strangely, the effect was spreading throughout the sect. Instantly, Jun turns off the radio and says everyone can pretend nothing happened and forget about this day. However, the Spring Sect Elder says he's never been humiliated like this in his entire life. Jun says he'll press the button and the Elder says he'll stop. With that, the event comes to an end. The Elder says he learned many lessons from Jun and will remember this incident, but that next time he sees him, he hopes Jun won't rely on tricks like these. He turns around and tells his group to come along. Jun replies saying one year, that's the time he has to train his disciples and come back for another challenge. The Elder gets excited and says fine, the deal is made and in a year, Jun will be crushed in this place. Finally, they leave. Jun bluffed about turning on the radio again because the stronger the person, the less time it works. He then thanks Yu Tang for helping clear up the misunderstanding. Yu Tang says there's no need to thank him, even though today he was humiliated. Jun says Yu Tang is very generous. It's thanks to him that the Steel Bones sect remains strong, so if he ever needs anything, just ask. Yu Tang says that if Jun keeps this promise, it will all be worth it, but he's curious why Jun challenged him to return in a year. Our boy responds that it's because he knows they wouldn't leave him alone without something like this. One year is enough time for them to stabilize. Besides, during this period, it would already be stronger. The Spring Sect leader is leaving, thinking that it doesn't matter if they have another year because they'll never catch up. No matter how demonic that music of his was, it must have some limit since it didn't kill anyone. He shouts at his entire sect, asking why they're all cowering just because of a little kiss. Then someone tells the Elder to wait. He falls at the Elder's feet and says he's a former disciple of the Rising Water Sect. They were wiped out, and he's willing to do whatever it takes to bring down that June. The scene shifts to someone putting up a sign in the middle of the sect, and everyone goes to take a look. It's Jun announcing that from now on, they've established the inner sect, and disciples will receive more resources. It looks like there will be competition between inner and outer disciples, and even those closest to the leader, the direct apprentices. Of course, the higher your position within the sect, the more resources you receive. One of them asks what this reward of the reforming liquid is, and another says they have no idea, but it must be amazing. Then they hear a sound. A bunch of auras was rising from the middle of the arena. Everyone runs, knowing for sure it's the aura of the seniors there. Jun tells everyone to look at the first inner disciples, Xiao Mutanki and a certain Lai Fei. Jun tells everyone to work hard because with the liquid that improves roots, there are no more natural limits for anyone. Now, everyone is excited, wanting to become an inner disciple. The scene shifts to a forest where a lion is eating another animal. Then Xing Chen approaches, and the lion leaps at him. He slaps it because of that time it hit him in the face with a ball. He prepares a punch, complaining about having to do that stupid dance and being annoyed that he still got a low-level crystal. Zuji comments that he seems very angry with the master and prepares his weapon, but Xingqin tells him not to take it so seriously. It was just a few angry words. However, the boy fires a shot that whizzes past Xingqin. He notices the bullet killed a beast that was right behind him that he hadn't sensed. He really needs to strengthen the natural roots of his body because it would be ridiculous to die from something like that. A little later in the cave, Xingqin thinks that although Xiaomu is strong, his vigilance is reassuring. This means he can practice in peace for now and evolve these roots as quickly as possible. He spends some time cultivating until suddenly, he wakes up covered in blood. Zuiji asks what happened, and he says he's fine. Although it was painful, his spiritual roots had advanced to the mortal level. Now with the Taizuan Sutra activated, he could feel everything around him. The next day, Jun asks if it's really the case. Again, they've become a target. King Yang confirms it, saying that as soon as they announced the inner disciple program, the spiritual spring sect declared they would finish them. The problem is that everyone knows they are much stronger, so no one wants to join his sect just to get beaten up for a while. But if that's the case, they should use it to their advantage and make the disciples train even harder. 
Then he notices someone approaching. A gray-haired boy introduces himself as Lang Zai Yang and says he admires the Steel Bone sect and wants to join them. Jun notices something peculiar. The boy went straight to King Yang and introduced himself to him. Jun immediately changes the sign, saying they're full and wonders if he's really that lacking in charisma to be a leader. But then someone else approaches, saying they want to join the Steel Bone sect. The boy is 15 years old and introduces himself as Yang Yuhua. Jun immediately yells to get 5XL uniform. Our boy is furious because, due to that spring sect bastard's announcement, his recruitment is slow, making it hard to reach the 500 members he needs. But at that moment, the seventh elder of the Nebula sect approaches, saying he's here to challenge the leader of this place. Jun knows this guy must have been sent by those who said they would give them some time. He receives the mission to defeat the Nebula sect leader and five of their disciples. He was going to forgive everyone, but since they couldn't contain themselves, he would have to be ruthless. Suddenly, the system starts rising and four had already been defeated. Jun wonders what's happening because he hasn't even done anything yet. Outside, the guys were already beaten up, terrified, begging to stop. But Zuju wants to know why such weak people dare to challenge them here. The Nebula Elder is confused. His third-rank apprentices didn't stand a chance. Wasn't this place only supposed to have disciples of at most rank 4? But now he has to act or the Nebula sect would be embarrassed. He leaves for Zuji, saying that the arrogant child will learn a lesson. But he freezes when someone calls out to the old man. From the back, Xingqian asks how a sect master dares to attack someone like this. Song is trembling in fear, barely able to stand. He thinks about grabbing his sword, but is too scared to act. Xingqian tells him that if he doesn't even have the courage to draw his blade in his presence, he should just go home. The old man starts trembling and faints on the ground, muttering that this place is full of monsters. The mission is completed, but Jun feels something strange. He asks the system about the strange energy he's sensing from Xingqian. The system explains that it's the power from his natural roots, typically called tyrannical roots. Our boy then says it wasn't bad at all. They really didn't disappoint after all their training. He announces that as a reward, they will receive two reforming liquids. He explains that it will enhance their natural roots. Zuji immediately drinks it, but Xingqian stands still smiling, thinking he never expected the leader to be a fraud in medicine. He knows very well how difficult it is to evolve someone's roots, and in this life, he had to suffer greatly just to advance a little. Meanwhile, Zuji is already shouting that he has advanced to the next level. Xingqian exclaims in disbelief, wondering if it really helped and worked that quickly. Jun then tells Xingqian that it's enough to get his roots to the mortal level. However, Xingqian grabs the liquid and calls out to Jun, informing him that while training outside, he had already advanced to the mortal realm, making the liquid useless. Jun says that if that's the case, he can have another one and evolve even further. Unable to avoid the shogunus, Xingqian decides to drink it and immediately feels a strange surge of power. His spiritual roots had increased in strength, and he didn't feel any pain. This medicine felt like a miracle, perhaps the kind of item that only exists in the realm of immortals. Even when he was the strongest emperor in the world, he would still be just an ant in that place. Considering how casually Jun handed that out, his identity isn't simple. Jun comments on how Xingqian said he advanced accidentally while hunting, suggesting that to tell such a lie, he must think the leader is an idiot, and he asks the system what it thinks. The system says that as far as it knows, there is no such technique unless it's something beyond the divine rank. Shocked, Jun asks if there's anything above that rank because he thought it was the limit. The system explains that every martial artist has their style and techniques they learn, and some of these arts evolve to a point that defies the laws of earth and heaven. It's as if they cannot be defined by a grade. Jun asks if the system knows any of these. It explains that tens of thousands of years ago, there was a supreme power called Tixuan. He created two techniques that are still considered incomparable treasures today, the Tixuan Ice Technique and the Tixuan Fire Sutra. Jun recalls that there used to be a first-rank sect called the Sacred Sect of Tixuan. The system confirms this, but that place was destroyed and became a ruin. Some time later, people found the ancient ice techniques and founded a new Tixuan. Using that knowledge, the new sect reached the top in the last 10,000 years. However, aside from a few scriptures, not much is known about these techniques. Many saints and martial emperors spent their entire lives searching for them, but none found even a hint. The system says that unless someone is the protagonist of a story, it's impossible to find something like this. Jun says he's sure that considering the level at which he found Xingqian, he must know some of these techniques. The system says there's a 7 in 10 chance. Jun says another possibility is that the scriptures are in the boy's mind. The system then asks what he plans to do if he's going to try to extract the boy's techniques, who is sneezing because they keep talking about him. Jun replies that he would never do such a thing. It would be disgraceful for a master to try to steal techniques from his student. Besides, with the system in hand, he can always get what he wants, especially some new relics. When he gets her sunglasses that allow him to see techniques, cultivation, and even the items a person is using. He gets excited that he'll be able to discover everything with just a glance. However, at that moment, he notices something strange. Numerous figures at the peak of the apprentice level are surrounding the sect, preparing for an attack. It seems the people from the Drizzle Tower haven't given up yet. 
For the safety of everyone there, they will have to deal with this threat. But first, he needs to gather more knowledge about them. In another place, someone says that to be an assassin, one must be careful about what they do and say, always on guard not to be caught and follow the code of assassins. Even if tempted by beauty or money, they must uphold the rules. They would not flee in fear, even in the face of death. At that moment, someone tells Brother 47 that she's back. He gets excited, saying he can already smell something delicious coming. Number 47 is still trapped in the sect and Dudu has brought something for him to eat. She tells him to enjoy because it was all made with love and care. He tells her not to worry, saying he won't waste anything. Only when he ate the things Dudu made did he feel happy. But just then, Jun enters and tells him it's time to spill the information about the Drizzle Tower headquarters or else. Everyone wants to know what will happen next. Our boy draws his sword, warning that his head will roll if he doesn't comply. Number 47 replies that if that's the case, this will be his burial ground. Dudu tells him he shouldn't say things like that because assassins have to keep emerging from the shadows. He should abandon the Drizzle people, join the Seal Bone sect, and be friends with everyone. He apologizes to Dudu but says that he's a ruthless assassin who cannot betray his tower. Jun then says that since he's so eager to die, he won't have a choice and warns him not to blame him for being so cruel. He takes away the food, announcing that Dudu's delicacies are only for his sect members. At that moment, he starts wasting the food. Dudu begins to cry desperately, pleading that he can't do that to her hard work. Number 47, confused about what to do, starts to cry and shouts that Dudu's food must not be wasted. He doesn't want to see something like that happen, so he agrees to join this damn sect and reveal the location of the Drizzle Tower's headquarters. However, he insists that it be clear he is not joining the whole sect, only Dudu's kitchen. Our boy is moved. It seems that only Dudu's innocence can win over this assassin. But now, the next step was decided. In a forest, a man runs almost out of breath. He goes to a tree and hides, wondering how someone has the nerve to come to the base of the Drizzle Tower. A hand reaches out from behind the tree, and another one is taken down. Of course, it's Jun killing everyone. He knows assassins kill people, but what shocks him is that these guys didn't hesitate for a second to kill their friends to reveal themselves. A pink-haired man praises Jun for having taken down two groups so silently, and he knows that bronze-level assassins won't be enough. Jun responds that it looks like he's being underestimated again, so he decides to spice things up. He unleashes a slash that tears through all the trees. The entire forest is demolished. Dudu falls to the ground and smoke rises. Jem declares that it's better this way with an open field that can see everyone clearly. Now they could have a proper conversation. Shun says he knows all about their group of assassins. Scorpion is the strongest, Viper is the one who impresses everyone. Bobcat is the most silent killer and Black Crow is the most vicious. The man spreads his wings and says it looks like there's a traitor among them. But that's fine because he'll just kill another one and add him to the collection. He mocks Jun, saying he's stupid for destroying the entire place and trying to take on so many. Jun says that when it comes to killing quietly, he's not that good, but he's here to face them directly. He prepares a punch and slams the ground. The entire area trembles and many stone slabs rise. The assassins quickly realize they're surrounded with him inside. Jun claps his hands and tells everyone to stay quiet as he announces that they're all surrounded by him. Suddenly, someone appears at the top of the cave. It's Black Hawk, who says Jun is pretty good at bluffing. But Jun wonders if this guy never learned how to assassinate because he's revealing himself too much. Any prey that jumps that high deserves punishment. Jun unleashes a series of slashes upward. Earlier, when talking to 47, Jun was impressed by the cruelties these guys committed. Number 47 explained that they used to do thorough research before killing someone, but things changed. When the original leader died and leadership passed a black scorpion, everything changed. Jun already suspects that the mission to kill him was likely given by this guy, proving he's incompetent since he sent 47 and a bunch of weaklings. In the middle of the fight, Jun raises his arm and declares he will save the Drizzle Tower. Their main assassin was nothing special. However, just as he's about to open his eyes, a guy almost kicks him, and Jun narrowly ducks out of the way. Jun mocks, saying that his sneaky attack was way too obvious and lands an inverted kick to the boy's chin, sending him flying. He tells him that he too will learn a lesson, but then a bunch of minions jump at him. Jun stomps the ground, raising some stones, prepares, and punches them, rebounding all the debris into their faces. Our boy taunts them, saying they should be ashamed of losing to a single person, but they are ordered to keep advancing and don't give him a chance. He sees two hands coming toward his face and sends the two fools spinning away. Jun prepares another punch, but more guys appear and grab his leg. He's completely immobilized and they call for their leader to finish him off right there. The leader smiles, saying this will be quick. The leader flies toward Jun, who compliments their teamwork, noting they're making things difficult for him. The only problem is they chose the wrong guy. All their effort was child's play for him. The leader lands a full hit, but his fingers break upon impact. Jem warns them that they're too weak to attempt something like this, and in their next life, they should pray to be better people. With that, the entire area explodes and the few remaining flee in desperation. Jun gets angry, knowing that if everyone escapes into the forest, it will be hard to track them down. 
But then three cartridges fly out and three fleeing men are struck down. Zuji announces that the sniper is up to date and the number of people escaping this place would be zero. The scene shifts to the leader being informed that more than 30 members had disappeared and they don't even know who the enemy is. Additionally, Black Hawk has also disappeared and the base was destroyed without even managing to send a message. The leader is also told that some of the bodies were analyzed and it seems they were hit by some kind of special weapon, indicating the enemy has some hidden secrets. He suspects it's something similar to what the Steel Bone sect has been using. The leader then informs Bobcat that it's his turn and that he better not disappoint. Bobcat says he understands and will return with their heads. He sets off immediately, determined to show who owns this forest. Bobcat flies towards someone. Jun is calmly walking when he senses something approaching. He turns and swats at the air, muttering that finding this assassin is becoming troublesome. He stomps on another one and wonders when this will end. He then asks the alert disciples if they notice any movement. Zuiju reports that using the legendary AX scope, he's spotting some human activity in the valley to the east. Just then, someone appears behind him, saying he's been used and that only two people were launching an attack against the Drizzle Tower. Zuji turns to react, but the enemy's attack lands squarely on his face. Jun notices someone falling and rushes to catch the boy. He grabs his arm and asks if he's okay, and if he saw how many enemies are there. But another attack is coming straight for Jun's eye. The enemy had already changed his outfit and almost caught him off guard, but Jun manages to dodge. The assassin praises Jun for dodging at such a short distance, Note he's faster than the boy whose neck he just broke. Jun doesn't like hearing that and immediately vows to finish him. In a second, he's face to face with Bobcat, who comments that it's strange. Bobcat almost lands another hit and Jun dodges, impressing the assassin further. He realizes that this boy isn't going to be easy to handle. Jun then tells the system to spend 100 points on the thing he refused to buy yesterday. The system warns that before using it, he needs to understand it, but Jun insists that he needs to comprehend it now because the person he's buying time for is already arriving. Zuji steps between the two and says that the attack left his neck stiff. Bobcat remarks that he used enough force to break giant marble and that he shouldn't be underestimated as no target has ever survived his sight. Jun makes some signs to Zuji, telling him to stall and buy time so he can learn the technique. Zuji tries to understand what he's signaling, probably thinking it's something like finish this guy as quickly as possible. He immediately yells that he's going to complete the task and charges at Bobcat, telling him to bring it on. The system bets 50 cents that Zuji didn't understand the signals. But Jun says there's no time for that now and orders the system to purchase the Divine Tower Sword Art. The Divine Tower Sword Art, a technique from the Temple of Emperors that enhances sword comprehension, has three styles. Meanwhile, Zuji is fighting with the assassin, who pulls a hidden knife from his shoe and strikes Zuji in the back of the neck. But the assassin is shocked when his knife shatters. Zuji misses another attack and Bobcat mocks that no matter how much Zuji dodges, if he can't hit back, he's just a punching bag. Then wires encircle Zuji's neck and the boy is yanked backward. Bobcat declares that if the neck didn't break the first time, it will now as this is his best assassination move. But Zuji simply throws his head back, grabs the wire with his hand, and hurls his body towards a tree, smashing it into pieces. Bobcat wonders if this boy is even human. Only a monster could pull off something like that. Zuji lets out a roar, grabs the tree, and throws it at Bobcat, who slices it into four pieces. Bobcat says that since Zuji is so tough, he'll handle this differently. He lunges at Jun, shouting that he'll kill him first. Zuji yells for his master, while Bobcat sees that Jun is cultivating in the middle of a fight. But Jun just smiles, saying the timing is perfect and activates the quick sword style. However, Bobcat claims it's too late. Jun thinks that perhaps having the sword be this fast isn't ideal. The enemy doesn't even realize he's been struck yet. Bobcat demands to know what nonsense Jun is talking about. Suddenly, Bobcat freezes and Jun asks if he finally felt it, a shiver down his spine. The lethality of that technique was extraordinary. Just by understanding the beginning of the formula, you could already be a martial master. The slash Jun had delivered split the man in two, and Jun apologizes, saying he'd have just learned it so he didn't know how to use it properly. But now, with this technique, he was sure the Drizzle Tower would be wiped out. The scene shifts to a mountain. A man calls for Lord Scorpion and says there's bad news. Bobcat's body is hanging at the front of the base, looking like it's in a weird pose. He'd been stitched and pinned. The message from Jun said he hoped they wouldn't give up. The leader thought he was being underestimated but didn't mind. He would call all the gold level assassins. It was time to burn their leader and the entire sect to the ground. The assassins begin running, all emerging from the cave. One of them, excited, says he's sure he's found him. He leaps and rushes in a direction, spotting someone. He mocks that the idiot exposed himself just because he sent a few trash fighters. He activates the scorpion's sting but runs straight into a strange item in front of him. Jun had thrown a smoke grenade. The man falls but quickly gets up, asking if that explosive was his trump card. Jun says no, it's not an explosive, it's tear gas. The man boasts that he has a high understanding of poison, so none of these would work on him. He starts giving orders to his team but suddenly starts acting strangely, unable to communicate properly. 
His men ask what's wrong, and he turns around in agony, crying that it hurts a lot. Obviously, it was a system item, much stronger than the usual. The leader begins to cry about how hard it was to create this organization, and Jun feels a bit sad about it. The assassins urge the leader not to cry so much or their hearts will break too. Everyone is desperate, lamenting that their lives as assassins are miserable. Jun is touched. These assassins even had a sense of hierarchy. He approaches, explaining that he used the gas because he planned to trap them in a net, but since they've lost the will to fight, it's easier to collect the experience. A sable tear rolls down his cheek as well. He then asks the system if he isn't supposed to be immune to this damn gas. The system replies that he's just a kid. Did he think he wouldn't cry? Desperate, Jun begins to lament that his life is terrible. Even in his second reincarnation, he's alone. He only has one attractive disciple, and all she thinks about is how to replace him as quickly as possible. He cries, complaining that life for men is becoming too difficult, while the assassins cry about how hard life is for an assassin. Zuji approaches, asking if they're having a competition for paying respects at graves. Jun asks if he isn't being affected by the gas and if he doesn't feel any negative emotions. Zuji explains that he's always filled with negative emotions so he doesn't feel any different. Jun starts crying, thinking he needs to fix the psychology of this sect. Above them, someone is watching everything unfold. It's the kind of scene you only see once in a century. He went out to get an idea of what Scorpion was planning. A dangerous girl comments that Scorpion has limited abilities to be in the leader's position, but the blonde man warns her that the two boys have some strange methods and shouldn't be underestimated. However, the girl responds that she's already a martial master and will use this chance to boost her morale within the team. Ten minutes later, both sides finally stop crying. The air is filled with confusion, and everyone feels a bit awkward. Jun tells Zuji to stop narrating everything that's happening and hand over the sniper rifle. Zuji pulls out the AWP and declares it's time for the final battle. The scene he's about to create will leave a lasting impression on everyone's mind. The assassins leap to kill him, and Jun says it looks like they're curious about what he can do. He orders the system to activate the enhanced mode and starts shooting all around. The first fool is hit, and Jun comments that hiding behind companions is a good idea, but it's too bad that when it comes to hitting targets, the leader of his sect is one of the best. He fires another volley in all directions. Jun announces that he doesn't want to kill anyone in vain, so anyone who surrenders won't be sent to reincarnation. But then, the leader spots a flaw, telling everyone get out of the way so he can finish this. Suddenly, Jun appears behind him. Confused, the leader asks how he learned the ghost's step of the Drizzle Tower. Jun explains he stole it from one of the assassins he killed and practiced it in a few minutes. For his next life, he suggests the leader be born in a world without guns and bids him say an era. However, something flies in and the bullet is destroyed right in front of him. Jun is impressed, if the first time he's met someone who can handle his shots. Jun turns to see who this new enemy is and is met with an extremely dangerous weapon. Even he admits that something big is coming. The fool falls to the ground, calling for the Grand Master. Jun comments that he didn't expect such an important woman from the Drizzle Tower to come to him like this. The woman simply tells him to listen to what the lady has to say, warning that insulting their institution isn't very smart. Jun blocks her attack with a bullet, but is terrified, knowing he only managed to hit that shot because of his aim assist. He then says that honestly her goal wasn't to kill Master Jun, but she needs to return a favor to someone. She sends two more knives, but Jun pulls out his Desert Eagle and shoots them down again. That's when he notices that the knives are colliding with each other and changing direction. He fires several shots around, stating that unfortunately for her, he's still a professional. In an instant, she uses the Ghost Seb and is right in front of him. Jun also activates his technique and manages to dodge, but in the middle of his movement, she launches an attack at his neck. As they dodge and fight, the guy who is fighting Jun is confused. Jun realizes that he won't be able to keep up with her ghost step for much longer, and the problem is that guns are ineffective at close range, and he doesn't have time to reload. The fight continues, but the guy is getting excited. If the two of them kill each other in this fight, the Drizzle Tower would be all his. At that moment, both Jun and the woman seem to notice something and attack him simultaneously, telling him to stop with his creepy laugh. The guy is struck in the forehead and chest, dropping to the ground like a sack of trash. Jun warns that the next attack will be 50 times faster and activates the ninth style of the heavy sword. He slashes the entire forest, attacking her with immense force. His blade is smoking, and he declares it's time to go home. She's going to be taken as a prisoner, and he asks who's against it, and who's for it. Back at the sect, a reconstruction sign is already up. King Yang announces that they'll work shifts to fix everything before the master returns. But he hears Jun's voice, who says they'll need to adjust the schedule, leaving King Yang shocked, wondering how he defeated the enemy so quickly. Jun explains that he brought some people from the assassin's sect who will be living with them for a while so they'll need to create space for them. King Yang immediately yells at the workers, telling them they need to fix the designs. Chen Qian asks if the master is afraid of killing that beautiful woman since bringing so many people will be difficult with so many mounts to feed. Jun tells her to stop with these stories and take everyone to the arena because he has matters to resolve. As the group enters, the woman warns Chen Qian not to put her hands around her chest, or they won't grow much, stretching in front of her. 
Porchy and Kian feels defeated, but Jun pats her head and explains that he brought them to be part of their intelligence team. Who would be more intelligent than an assassin? But she would never have to worry about losing her position as head girl. Chan Kian feels better for a moment, but then she runs off, feeling too excited to have said something like that only to hit her face on a wall near the sex water. However, Chen Chan noticed something different in her heart. She needed to remain calm like water. The scene shifts to Jun asking the woman her name, and she introduces herself as Lai Liu Q. He comments that it seems some assassins from the Drizzle Tower don't want to stay there, but she says it's fine because she's who she is, and they are her men. The only problem is that it seems a bit cramped. Jun had created a vertical cell, stacking them on top of each other, saying unfortunately, they're short on space. Liu Chu then asks if he plans to keep them in prison for long. Jun responds that he doesn't like to waste time and is interested in inviting her and all her men to join his sect. If she accepts, she'll become the master of their intelligence pavilion. Liu Qiu says it seems like he's joking since she's an assassin who never affiliates with any sect. Jun questions how an assassin who always hides can talk about freedom and advises her to speak with the rest of her friends. He adds that the Steel Bone sect has been evolving rapidly lately. Joining the sect is like buying a cheap stock and one day when the Steel Bone sect becomes the strongest, she'll be the master of that pavilion. He tells her to imagine the benefits she'll receive like this incredible weapon, martial resources, and skills she's never dreamed of. However, he warns her to think carefully because this is the only time she'll receive this offer. Loki asks what the benefits of being the master of the pavilion are. But what can you do? The only way forward is to solve one problem at a time. Last time, the Drizzle Tower sent three assassins and Jun had already survived five times. He remembers that one of the people he investigated revealed that the Xiao family was raising some assassins, and perhaps he was their target. Jun was curious about why they would focus on him like that and ordered Snake Venom to observe the movements of all families involved with assassins. Later, he prepared a punch and hit the training dummy with full force. He had no idea what 3 DLU and 1.4 EVU meant, but that was the damage dealt. Jun says he's finally reached level 9 of Martial Apprentice, but with twice the power. As soon as he reaches the peak of the Apprentice level, he can finally advance to Martial Master. However, his progress rate isn't fast enough, as they need to teach those guys a lesson within a year. The most important thing is to level up the sect, and to do that, he needs to raise the level of everyone here. For that, he has to deal with those who keep bothering them. The Noble Spirit sect will be used as a stepping stone for the Steel Bone. In a year, when they have to face the boss, these guys will be the elite mobs. He punches the ground, sending rocks flying. It's time to increase the training for everyone and crush those guys in a month. But then he realizes he threw stones at the construction crew again. King Yang notes it down, saying that for vandalism, Jun owes the sect 666 coins. The next day, signs are put up for the first Steel Bone Sect gathering. Kasayomo runs and throws a punch, and King Yang announces that he hit 6,000 power. Excited, he says speed equals strength. But then Zuiji also throws a punch and gets 9,000. Kasayomo knows he can't compare to a guy who wants to become a block of stone. But suddenly, there's an explosion behind them. Yi Extinction caused 10,000 damage. Kasayomo realizes he's the clown of this place. Yi Kaxingchen is motivated. He's combining the sutra techniques he already knew with the ones distributed in the sect. However, Jun doesn't seem pleased. Chen Chen was good at spiritual magic. Suji's body was strong and Yi Kaxingchen's punch carried a lot of power. Lai Fi and Qian Qi weren't bad either. They had shields, long-range fighters, and frontline combatants. But they still needed one more person for the offensive spot. At that moment, a long-haired guy approaches, heading toward the testing stone. He draws his sword, which immediately begins emitting an aura. In a second, he passes with a slash. The guy dealt 50,000 damage with his blade. Jun wonders how this guy is so strong. Yi Xingxin notes that to have this kind of power, the guy is at least a sword master. He can also sense that the guy is hiding some of his strength, a quality only a genius of sword cultivation would have. However, Yi Xingxin advises sending the guy away because they don't have any sword techniques to help him practice. At that moment, Jun slaps a technique in his face. But Yi Xingxin is convinced that what Jun is offering is trash for someone of that caliber. He recalls that in his past life, he practiced the Nine Clouds sword technique, which was definitely better. It's then that Yi Extinction realizes that what he learned was actually garbage, and he wonders how Jun always has a god-level technique. Jun tells him not to focus on the details because all of this is just to take down the Noble Spirit sect. Yi Extinction says that with these techniques, a month is more than enough to finish everyone there. Jun says he seems confident but reminds him that they wouldn't win in a war of attrition. He then tells all the disciples to listen up. From today, they will start practicing spiritual energy because their bodies have reached the limit of cultivation. The spiritual energy practice circle will be open 24 7 In addition, many will receive transformation liquids. During this month of preparation, Jun will spend all the items he's accumulated to strengthen them. It's time for the whole world to start knowing the name of the Steel Bone sect. He tells the kids that in a month, they'll make a lot of noise. 
He starts telling everyone to practice, saying it's time to hit the like button on this video that helps Mamoru make more juicy content for his viewers, activate the cheeky little bell, and I'm out.